Pero, dinownload ko na rin naman po yung okay. slides ni Sir kasi baka mawala pa yung internet. Ayos mo na siya later para. Sige. Good afternoon, everyone. May we request everyone to please settle down. The program will begin in one minute. May we now request everyone to please rise for the Philippine National Anthem. Ms. Ina Moralejo of the UP Concert Chorus will be leading. Bayang magiliw, pelas na silanganan, alab ng puso sa dibiboy buhay. Lupang hinirang, duyan ka ng magiting Sa manlulupig, di ka pa sisiil Sa dagat at pundok, sa simoy at sa langit mong pukhaw May dilagang tula at awit sa paglayang minamahal Ang kisap ng watawat mo'y tagumpay na nagniningning Ang bituin at araw niya kailan pa may di magdidilim Lupa ng araw na walhat at pagsinta Buhay langit sa piling mo Amin ligaya na pag may mga api Ang mamatay ng dahil sa'yo Please take your seats Thank you very much, Ina. Let me now begin by greeting everyone in this auditorium and our 150 plus participants on Zoom. A very, very good afternoon. I think we're gonna show the gallery shot. Okay, so lots of people joining us online as well. We also have participants who are watching our live stream through the UP School of Economics official YouTube channel. Welcome everybody. Ah, there you go. Everybody wave hi to our Zoom participants. Hello, everybody. All right. So welcome to the fifth lecture of the PCED at 50, 
lecture series, 50 Years of Economic Policy Making. This event is presented to you by the UP School of Economics and the Philippine Center for Economic Development. I'm your host for today. I'm Mimi Young. I'm seeing lots of uh, familiar, friendly faces, faces I've chased down the hall, faces I still text all the time. So please reply. I will look for you later. <laughs> In the meantime, the year is 2023. The world has moved on from COVID-19. We're back out. We've reopened this time facing a different set of challenges. You've got the inflation boogeyman and the higher for much longer rate environment. In the Philippines, we're getting a rice squeeze, trying out a new sovereign wealth fund and turning on the charm offensive to attract investors. But with growth stalling, not our fault entirely, are we still on track to bring poverty rate down to single digit by 2028, be a $1 trillion economy by 2033, and in the words of NEDA, have a prosperous, predominantly middle-class society where no one is poor by 2040. What an exciting time to be an economist, and what an honor to be among all of you. Today, we look ahead by looking back. Five decades ago, on May 13, 1974, the Philippine Center for Economic Development, or PCED, was created. PCED has continuously fulfilled its mandate to support the UP School of Economics in its efforts to provide quality economic education, training, and research that aid national economic policy making. In celebration of PCED's 50 years of contribution to economic education and development, the PCED at 50 lecture series was crafted. This lecture series runs from May to November of this year, featuring talks of former National Economic and Development Authority heads, Dr. Sikat, Professor Monsod, Dr. Habito, Dr. Medalia, and today's speaker, Dr. Canlas, Dr. Balisakan, and of course, Dr. Pernia. Today, we hold the fifth PCED at 50 lecture, Avoiding a Low Middle Income Trap, Lessons Learned from the NEDA and Academe. May I now call on Dr. Emmanuel Esguera to be introducing our speaker through a written piece by Mr. Romeo Bernardo. Dr. Esguera. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to read to you Romy Bernardo's introduction of our featured lecture today. The text reads as follows. Let me start with an apology that I cannot be personally present to introduce our featured lecturer. But it is not my fault. As some may know, it is my first day on the job. Monetary board meeting. I won't devote much time enumerating the outstanding academic government service record and awards of our speaker. Many here know of them. They are a matter of public record and downloadable from the web. What I would like to do is to introduce to you the man behind the accomplishments and awards. What we who work with him and his students know. First, <clears throat> Dante as the impervious college heartthrob. He was already a member of the faculty when I was a student. According to the female students, there were two in the faculty who qualified for the title Crush Nambayan. One told me that she would sit in front of their classes, doubtless because of their pedagogical skills, not because of their looks now. Our speaker was, was thought of as the Harrison Ford of UPSE. Ford as Han Solo of Star Wars 1, not the old guy in the latest Indiana Jones movie. There was one difference between him and the other Crash Nambayan, I was told. Our speaker had no idea that he was good looking and a heartthrob. And quote, that made him all the more attractive. 
That's according to one who is now married to a faculty member and former top official. Second, NEDA Undersecretary Dante as the quiet, modest achiever and ideal collaborator. <clears throat> I had the good fortune and privilege of being his counterpart at the DOF during the Ramos administration. We worked with ultra-competent professionals like then-budget undersecretary Emmy Bonkodin, <clears throat> then Central Bank, later BSP Director for Economic Research, Sai Tetanko, and others. One could not have wished for better teammates with abundant intelligence, integrity, industry, and zero fanfare and zero ego. This quite efficient technical teamwork allowed our bosses to attend to their more political aspects of economic governance, even as we, the most senior technicians, attended to the knitting including various interagency committees, debt negotiating panels, and donor conferences. Our speaker chaired the Investment Coordination Committee, the ICC Technical Board, with me as his co-chair. The ICC had the difficult task of putting together an investment program to fund enormous infrastructure and social expenditure requirements at a time when interest payments alone ate up 20 to 30% of the budget and foreign component a substantial part of export receipts. Mind you, this was when we were still reeling from the debt crisis, no access to capital markets, and still finding our bearings politically as a nation. I would like to think we got the job done with the support of the donor and financial community, <clears throat> which saw the Philippine macro and structural reform program as worthy of support. <clears throat> These reforms included accession to the WTO, a comprehensive tax reform program, and a privatization effort that raised tax and overall revenues to record highs as shares of GDP, breaking up monopolies, breaking up of monopolies, and partnering with the private sector in delivering public services, especially in power and water, and the creation of an independent monetary authority to replace the bankrupt old central bank. All these led to the country's eventual exit from IMF surveillance. <clears throat> Our speaker was very much on top of putting those programs together with the Department of Finance coordinating. One can say lobbying and securing effort, securing support rather, of bilateral, multilateral institutions to fund the same. There is a saying that nothing is impossible for the man who does not care who gets the credit. This describes Dante. Third, Secretary Dante, principles over principle. Given his personal and professional virtues known by all, it was no surprise when President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo tapped him, her dissertation advisor, <coughs> to be her economist in chief. I was no longer in government then, but from all I know, had she listened to him on a key infrastructure project, the deeply flawed North Rail project, the Philippines could have been spared some $185 million in public money that we had to pay China as creditor with nothing to show for it. He left government over that issue what is not clear to me is whether his resignation was accepted as a matter of loss of confidence, a prerogative of the president, or whether this was a case of Dante being just ahead of the curve, 
two and a half years ahead of Hayat 10. Dante knew he owed his principals his best advice, and he gave it even when this, this was not, this may not be what they wanted to hear and may cost him his job. To have done otherwise would have been a disservice to them and a betrayal of his principles of who he is, and ultimately a betrayal of our ultimate principles the Filipino people. It is in the best interest of our leaders to listen more to people like Dante. History will be kinder to them if they did. Finally, may I publicly reveal a fervent wish to be able to work with Dante soon. That's the end of the text. So on that note, let's all welcome Professor Dante Canlas. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, Mani, for reading that uh, introduction from Romy. Uh, I don't know if my talk will rise to the level of that introduction, but I'll give it my best shot. Uh, thank you all for coming over, and uh, thank you for having me. Let me get on with what I prepared to do this afternoon in the way of a talk or a lecture, as they call it, under this uh, PCED at 50 lecture series. I'm the fifth speaker in this lecture series. I hope I can uh, really contribute, make some value added to what my predecessors, four of them, have done. So. Today, my, uh, the topic I chose is uh, avoiding a low middle income trap, lessons learned from the NEDA and the academe. And uh, I've organized my lecture after my introduction and the old review. I'll take up first lessons learned in line with my TOR under this lecture series when I was in NEDA. And part two, I'll jump to a uh, development problem that I think is not quite solved yet, and that is avoiding a low middle income trap. Uh, my discussant, uh, one of them, both of them I think will be able to update us on all of these things because this uh, kind of a development problem is still with us. And so I think it's very important to open up a discussion on this particular development theme. And then I'll close with the, the summing up. Uh, how many minutes do I have to present? Uh, how much? 40. 40. Okay. I've got 40 minutes to deliver this talk. I hope to do it within that time frame. Don't close the mic on me if I exceed it, okay? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> let me start with my introduction and overview. Uh, let me talk a bit about the three institutions uh, that uh, we are all hearing. There's the Philippine Center for Economic Development, or the PCED. That's a nonprofit government organization that's providing moral and financial support to the teaching, research, and the extension activities of the UP School of Economics. So it started in 1974, and it will be 50 years 
next year. So this, like a, this lecture series is like a prelude to that uh, 50th anniversary. And then the UP School of Economics, where we are, is a knowledge-producing institution of higher learning engaged in economic education and training, research, <coughs> as well as extension work. All three we'd like to think have public good dimensions that merit support from PCED, financial support from PCED. For one, it serves society's needs to produce individuals with advanced skills in economic analysis. They're both these people, this skilled manpower base, you can find them in government, in local gov at, at various levels, including the local government units, but you can now find them also in the private sector. So, uh, there, I think, I would like to believe that we are delivering a public good as a result. And then there's the National Economic and Development Authority. This is the socioeconomic planning agency of the government. That's it's coordinating as its main task the formulation of the medium-term Philippine Development Plan. We used to call it MTPDP, but now I notice that we just call it the Philippine Development Plan. Anyway, the medium term, it coincides with the term of the president, so it usually applies over a period of six years. And if you look at the uh, series of MTDPs that have been issued by different presidents since, uh, I'll date it, since 1986, you will see that uh, the development goal there is to transform the economy into a newly industrializing one as provided for in the Constitution. It's a joint venture of NEDA, the coordination of the MTPDP with other oversight agencies and we work closely, for example, at NEDA with the Department of Budget and Management, the Department of Finance, as well as the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. But we also, at the time, and I will go into that as I go along, uh, with the Department of Trade and Industry, particularly because we were into an import liberalization and a tariff reduction uh, program. So, let me uh, say a bit about what I intend to do in this lecture. First, uh, in lessons learned, so I'll just review the past historical lessons from my NEDA days which is span the period 1992 to 1998. I started my work there as a deputy director general in charge of the National Development Office, the NDO. At the time, it was still handling all the major tasks of the NEDA, which included uh, policy and planning, uh, pro um, program development as well as uh, social development and then the monitoring and evaluation of all the major capital projects of the country. So uh, I work with several staffs in that particular office. And then next, I will open up a discussion of industrialization, which as I said, is not yet quite solved at this point. So, Relatedly, that means avoid getting mired in a low middle income trap, okay? And in, in speaking to these twin topics, I also bring lessons learned from the School of Economics plus the other academic and public institutions that I visited over the period I joined the School of Economics as a faculty member in 1975, mandatorily retired in 2012, but reappointed as a professor emeritus from 2017 to the present period. I'm still a professor emeritus, though that gives me an opportunity to go back to the School of Economics, do some teaching and research as a result. So essentially the question that I pose to myself, and I pose it to you too, because I don't have all the answers, what lessons from the past are useful in navigating the present? And then moving toward, how can we move towards a better future? 
That is, how can we avoid getting married in a low in middle income trap? So the stories I'll tell you today are all in that context. Okay. Uh, I would like to start with uh, the fact that I've seen policy making from two sides now at UPSC and the other academic institutions that I visited and mainly what I do here, teach macroeconomics, money as well as labor and then do some research and writing in these same areas. And then there is what we call a limited practice of profession because the University of the Philippines, before you take on a job outside of teaching and research, you will have to get a permission, sign something that it's just a limited practice or profession. Nobody observes that though, so that we have a joke going around. It's an unlimited practice or profession. We go only as a result. And then, of course, at NEDA, as I said, I headed the National Development Office first as a DDG when I entered in 1992. And then I became a DG during the um, entry of uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo as the president to take over from then President Estrada. It was in charge of the three major tasks that I mentioned. And I'd like to mention at this point that as a deputy director general, I was working with talented directors and uh, key staffs there, including NPPS, that's National Policy and Planning. The IUS is a sector staff in charge of trade and industry. Another sector staff is agriculture staff, AS, and then the social development, and then infrastructure, another important staff at the time, together with the, pro, the one in charge of programming, that's public investment, and, PM, and then the project and monit monitoring staff. Rolly was my director at the time. He's here with us today. I don't know if the other directors are here. And then, of course, as Romy Bernardo mentioned, we were working together with the other oversight agencies in what we call the interagency committees of the NEDA board or the IAC. So key agencies we worked with, the BM, the OF, DTI, and the BSP. So at this point, let me make, uh, uh, take this opportunity to thank, uh, express my sincerest gratitude to the talented senior officials, the directors, and the staffs I work with at NEDA, as well as the other senior officials of other agencies in the IACs. And the usual disclaimer before I proceed to my main themes, uh, the institutions where I work and the people I work with are not responsible for the opinions and conclusion I'll say today. All remaining errors in my talk are mine alone. Okay, so let me start with the lessons learned. Uh, first, uh, let me use this as my point of departure. Two aspects of economics. There's what we call the positive or the descriptive part of economics, and then there's the normative or the prescriptive economics. The positive economics, we do a lot of that in the university. And uh, we normally build models to show or to describe how the world works. So, but as Robert Solo, the Nobel Prize, one of the Nobel Prize winners in the economics, has said, uh, models are not quite true. We do a lot of, we embellish them with a lot of abstractions. We simplify a lot of things from the real world. And there's no single model that fits all. So different researchers can come up with different models. But we know that the most developed is the competitive equilibrium model with its extensions. Many of the extensions will include allocation under risk and uncertainty, or since information is limited and not equally distributed among market agents, we have what we call allocation under asymmetric information. And then we talk about a lot about externalities and market failures, which is 
of great importance to people who eventually do policy making in government. And then we talk a lot about transaction costs and missing markets, particularly in the insurance market and in the credit market. And then there is imperfect competition. And I name drop some names there, the very famous ones, Kenneth Arrow and Gerard De Bru. Now we come to all, we do also normative prescriptive economics. We talk about policy implications of certain models, but once you enter government, you will be dealing a lot with policy making. And this is where we call it normative because it's also the prescriptive part of economics. We recommend policies on how the world ought to work. And that's done largely in the government. Uh, luckily or unluckily, the moment you do that in government, talking about how the world will ought to work, we get immersed in what we call political economy. And this is the competition among interest groups for favorable policies, okay? The interest groups, they differ in the power and in the force. So you, they normally get a lot of good policies that will promote their own interest. Okay, so these are the two things. And uh, uh, economists, whether in government or outside in the academy, for example, may agree on the models that they build, okay? Although they also quarrel a lot over those models, but they dispute a lot the normative, how the world will ought to work. So when you come up with policies, you better design it well because you know that there will always be somebody there, some other competing interest groups will say, that's not a good policy. For example, right now, in the con this is very current, the monetary policy, how to conduct it, we hear things like, I think, they are meeting right now in the monetary board, so do we go into more interest rate hikes or shall we continue the pause, meaning stop first? Or, no answers from me, please. So, or does money matter in bringing the economy out of, uh, to full employment? Does it matter? So, can you coax GDP growth from an increase in inflation. Again, that's an issue to debate, okay? And then how do you address the needs of the credit disturb, the agrarian and reform beneficiaries, the micro and small medium enterprises, as well as the local government units who like to borrow also to finance their local plans? Now, do you build? Do you have to put up a special fund and do some directed credit for them. So those are some of the poly issues that are debated a lot. So what do we do in government? We do a mix of policies, both positive and then normative, but we combine them and then engage the com competing interest groups and government for is expected to take care of the interests of the disadvantaged members of society. So the government should carry the proxy votes for the unrepresented generations, particularly when we design environmental protection and now climate change mitigation. Future generations are not represented, so how do we design policies so that their welfare will not suffer by current uh, policies, okay? So let me review. <laughs> Uh, some of, I call them the greatest hits. I got this from Mani Esguera. <laughs> These are the important reforms that have had lasting implications on the economy, as well as on the social development of people. During the period 1992 to 1988, 92 I entered government as a DDG. So quickly, because I'll go to one by one, go to these things. They're succeeding to the World Trade Organization in 1995. And once we were able to accede to the WTO, Fidel Ramos was able to accelerate the import liberalization and tariff reduction program of President Cory Aquino. 
Okay? It was a nice platform having acceded to the World Trade Organization. And then he was able to close a fiscal gap using tax and non-tax reforms, non-tax like privatization. And as a result of all those fiscal as well as the monetary policy reforms, the Philippines was able to, ex to exit from an international, international monetary fund that SBA is standby credit arrangement. That's when you borrow from the IMF, but withdrawal from that SBA is not automatic. You have to conform to some policy conditionality practices of the IMF. And the government was still, the, to use the words of Romy, was still reeling from the foreign debt crisis of 1983 at the time. And so we still had to comply with, we had to still apply for an SBA from the IMF. And then there was the electricity and water crisis, which is also traceable to, 1980, to the 1983 crisis. I'll talk about that too. And then of course, what I consider probably one of the most important reforms of that period was establishing the BSP as an independent monetary authority. The D.Y. Shear, I think he's got a lot to say about those things. If you read his columns, uh, you will see all of the beautiful insights on that independent monetary authority. Okay, acceding to the, to the uh, WTO. Uh, maybe not everybody in this hall uh, know that the World Trade Organization was and envision as one of the three Bretton Woods institutions. One is the IBRD, or the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, that's also known now, popularly referred to now as the World Bank, IBRD. And then the IMF, and its role was really to coordinate at that time, fixed exchange rate policies among the major members of the allies, allied uh, community. So it was still a fixed exchange rate uh, when it started. The WTO formation was delayed. Why? Because the developed countries did not want to submit trade in agriculture to the most favored nation principle. And what's that MFN, or the most favored nation principle? Uh, first, you have to tarify everything. No protection through quantitative importing restrictions. It's got to be tarified if you want to protect certain local industries. They didn't want to submit anything in agriculture at the time because it was still, call it in disarray, trade in agriculture at the time. So what was established was the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or the GATT. And that prevailed over a long period of time, from 1948 to 1994. It was finally set up, the World Trade Organization in 1995, and the Philippines became a WTO signatory in 1995, okay? At the time, NEDA defended accession in the Senate because acceding to the WTO is a treaty, and therefore the Senate Committee of the Lords was the one conducting all of those hearings. So NEDA had to go to those hearings, and we supported it. But it was not really very problematic at the point because there was lots of optimism about globalization during that particular period. Okay, so there's the MFN principle that I mentioned already, tarify everything, and then once you offer a commercial benefit to one member country, you cannot withhold that from all the other member countries. Well, one major benefit from the WTO, our accession, was greater market access for Philippine exports. And at the time, uh, the institutional arrangement was, we still have, I don't know if it is still called, the Tariffs and Related Matters Committee, or the TRM, chaired by the DTI, and uh, it will recommend the phases as well as the uh, pacing of the ILTR to be approved by the Philippine president when Senate was not in session. So that's very important. Senate was not in session. So 
tariffs and related matters committee could meet. I, I think it's still the same arrangement. And then if you want to raise or uh, reduce tariffs on certain goods, then you do it through that tariff and related matters committee. And once the president signed it, if Senate is not in session, that's the inter-parliamentary courtesy that is sometimes in walk today. Okay? So the trade industrial goods was on a priority lane, like an express lane, but for agriculture, it was still a separate time track. So countries, particularly developing countries, were given a longer time to craft their import liberalization for rice. So at the time, we were already talking about rice tarification, but we could not get it through because um, DA would always argue for further postponement, et cetera. And we know that the rice tarification got accomplished only in 2019 under that Republic Act 11203. Now, what's important to note is that the WTO also has a dispute settlement mechanism. If a member country believes that it's being injured by imports, then it can go to the dispute settlement and ask for some protective tariffs like anti-dumping. Unfortunately, in 2019, we got the rice tarification law, and when rice prices started to go down, uh, the government did not make any move in terms of uh, uh, correcting the injuries caused to local farmers. And at this point, because we still have the rice problem, there's no evidence that the Rice Competitiveness Enhancement Fund, RCEF, has made our local farmers globally cost competitive. We want to see that with the RCEF because we know they're disadvantaged by liberalization of imports, but you must support them with the RCEF. Okay. Then another, one of the greatest hits is recovering the foreign tax revenues from the import liberalization. Because ILTR will bring about an erosion of taxes and duties collected at the border by the Bureau of Customs. And it declined those uh, customs duties being collected declined from 30.2% in 1990 to 23% in 1997. So that's a significant decline. So Ramos called for a summit on closing the fiscal gap that was convened. And let me just mention a political economy sidelight because one, closing the fiscal gap would mean tax reform. So NEDA and the other IACs Campaign, campaign with the local government units through the League of Mayors and Governors to support tax reforms. And they did. Why? Because the local government code of 1991 was already in place and it provided for decentralization that defined a division of labor between national government and the local government units, but it had to be bucked. That division of labor was bucked by the so-called IRA, so the Internal Revenue Alignment. So the LGU supported tax reforms because it brought in the IRA base, okay? So we got, we call it now the Comprehensive Tax Reform Program of 1997, it adjusted the previous one on personal income taxes passed by the Cori administration. We call it SNIT, Simplified Net Income Taxation. But uh, I think after being reviewed during the process of hearing C the proposed CTRP bill, uh, it was giving a lot away, SNIT. So it had to be adjusted. And then, of course, Ramos, without raising, the VAT rate, value-added tax rate, expanded coverage. So you increase your collection of VAT, not by raising the VAT rate, but by expanding the coverage. Okay, so in addition to the tax reform, the CTRP, we also had non-tax revenues. If you recall, 
PNB and Petron were both privatized during that period. Okay? And then the sale of the military baselands, now the big mall or uh, resort, the Fort Bonifacio. And as a result, uh, tax effort, the taxes divided by GDP reached 17% in 1996. It was one year ahead of the scheduled target. 1996. And as a result, when the 1997 Asian financial crisis uh, broke out, no recession. There was a slowdown of GDP growth, but no recession. So uh, that's what happened. The fiscal as well as the monetary reform led to a very strong economy that was able to withstand the 1997 financial crisis. And then in 1998, we had the last standby arrangement with the IMF. And right now, we're still getting the missions from the IMF, but they're under the Article 4 review, okay? Mandated under the charter as a member country of the IMF, but no more conditionality lending at this point. Okay. Let me just revisit uh, that point about complying with the IMF program during that period. Uh, what brought about the problem? There was counter-cyclical fiscal spending in 1983 toward the output decline from the oil price shocks in the mid-70s, and that led to recurrent deficits financed by borrowing. Okay? It's like a Keynesian thing. And Argentina, Mexico, and Philippines, which borrowed heavily during the period, defaulted on their foreign loans in succession. Argentina in 81, Mexico in 82, Philippines in 83. So now, thinking back, what are the lessons learned? The output gains or GDP gains from counter-cyclical spending was very temporary. And so there's no such thing as infinite borrowing because by 1993, Philippines was already in default. So the Philippines had run to the IMF, signed an LOI to get a standby credit arrangement, which has conditionality uh, practices. It's an application of the funds, uh, financial programming techniques, and that one, all of you who are taking courses in international finance know that that is based on a monetary approach to BOP deficits. So we got an austerity program, tighten money and government spending to begin with, and the economy didn't react neutrally to austerity. So the Philippine economy entered the recession two years, 84 to 85. Uh, again, uh, more reforms and particularly monetary, and that was toward an independence of the Banco Central, and then the fiscal included the CTRP. That helped uh, the Philippines exit from a standby credit arrangement in 98, and then uh, the nine, that helped the Philippines overcome the 1997 Asian financial crisis, our first brush with contagion that was triggered by the depreciation of the Thai baht against the U.S. dollar, okay? And then here's the other greatest hit that I have, the establishing an independent monetary authority. So that was in 1993 when the Banco Central, that's how, what we call it today from the old central bank, was established as an independent monetary authority. And independence was from the fiscal authority consisting of the executive and the legislative. And that enabled the PSP to institute rules rather than discretion. And BSP has, ad has since then adopted inflation targeting as a monetary policy rule, which is a significant improvement over exchange rate targeting when the peso periodical collapse against the US dollar. And as a prior action, BSP started with a clean balance sheet, central bank, board of liquidators was set up to take over the liabilities of the old CB. And then there's the reinvention of the monetary board 
majority of the members now come from the private sector, only one of the presidents, uh, I, I thought it was economic managers, but uh, Diwa uh, told me that it's now, the president can appoint anyone from his or her cabinet to sit in the monetary board. Okay, and then there's overcoming the electricity and w water crisis. Maybe some of you were not born yet, but uh, again, to refresh your memory, there was no new power generating capacity since 1983 from the National Power Corporation. So in 1992, 1993, when Ramos entered government as president, the economy suffered from daily brownouts lasting 11 hours. We called it brownouts, but they looked more like blackouts, 11 hours a day. So aggregate output was flattened. Of course, there were some other factors. So the Electric Power Crisis Act was enacted in 93, which allowed private power generators to enter without competitive bidding with decor pay contracts uh, remove the monopoly power of the national power over power generation. And because of the 97 AFC, Asian financial crisis, there was an excess capacity in 1997. And then the water crisis was in 1995. Again, even the ODA donors would not want to finance the MWSS because it was not able to comply with its loan covenants with the financiers. So the two private commissioners that won the bids were Manila and Manila Water, the ones we have now. And they are operating the east and west zones of the franchise area of WSS. Uh, coverage in these two areas has significantly improved under private concessionaires. We practically get 24 hour coverage in water. At the time, you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, as I said, you were not born yet, some of you. You wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, peel up your balde, so that in the morning you would have water. Can you imagine that? Because you would have a two-hour coverage only of water supply at the time. But now we have 24 hours. But we have to admit that at this point, affordability of user cost or user cost still remains a concern. But again, there are many factors behind that, not just delivery by the concessioners. Okay, this brings me to 2001 and 2002 when I was appointed as the Director General when uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo assumed the presidency in 2001, January 2000 in fact. And then, uh, so I was around for two years because that was from January to December 2002. We inherited also budget deficits from the Strada administration. <clears throat> Let me step up my presentation. So to, to give chance already to my discussions who are all, both accomplished, all accomplished, accomplished uh, economists. Closing the fiscal gap was top priority. So what actions were taken during that period? A stud, tax study team under NEDA uh, was formed and we came up with a report in April 2001. And then the Department of Finance also sought technical assistance from the IMF to arrest the revenue decline and the report came out in July 2001. And then the president mounted a summit in December 2001, and the, cons the policy consensus that emerged was closing the fiscal gap. So the budget deficit came back in 2002. I remember in 2001, at the end of that year, we were featured in the cover of the Tatler magazine, like we were a dream team because we were able to address the fiscal gap. But the deficits came back in 2002. Main reason, I believe, was that uh, the BIR Revenue District Office rebelled against the IMF prescription about transforming BIR tax collection management, particularly those dealing with incompetent and unsatisfactory personnel of the BIR. So, uh, I think you've heard of the 
rallying cry at the time, it was corporatization of the VIR. I think the revenue district officers didn't like that. So the targets were not met in 2002. Even the large taxpayers unit, which was set up, failed to deliver on its targets, okay? So one of the actions taken was President Arroyo instituted monthly area-based conferences among the RDOs and appointed a new BIR director, now deceased, uh, Guillermo Paraino. Okay, and then let me talk about the other policy reforms, 2001 and 2002. The president launched an updated MTPDP covering the period 2001 to 2004. And then for the first time it featured in chapter two, the decent and productive employment under the auspices of the ILO program. And then three legs, major legs of the decent and productive employment was efficient labor market operations, harmonious employee-employer relations, social protection and adherence to human rights and international labor standards. Those three goals are not met completely at this point. And then, uh, you might have forgotten, the EPIRA was enacted in 2001, which is a profound reform of the electric power industry. One, remove the monopoly of NPC, just like the Electric Power Crisis Act, which allowed private power generations to enter without competitive bidding. Now it's back to competitive bidding, of course. And transmission was bid out to a private concessioner won by the National Grid, Corporation of the Philippines, but distribution remained private. The biggest is still Meralco, but every new entrant must be regulated by the Energy Regulatory Commission, or what we now call the ERC, okay? I resigned from the cabinet by the end of December 2002. See, Gloria Macapagalap ran and won in 2004, so I was out already when the political turmoil uh, intervene, including, if you recall, Hello Garci, Hyatt 10, as well the National Broadband, Broadband Network associated with the provider uh, ZT. I wasn't out, so I am not privy to what happened. Don't ask, ask me about those things during the open forum. And the fiscal gap reemerged in 2005, but one of the things that was done to avoid a fiscal crisis that the VAT rate was raised from 10% to 12% in 2006. A faculty group from here had issued a statement urging her to hike the VAT. And that happened from 10 to 12%. And that more or less uh, warded off the uh, fiscal crisis. Okay. So let me move on to the uh, second part of my presentation. I'll try to go fast because I'd like this to be taken up in the open forum, more time for this. And this is, as I said, the problem that's not quite solved yet, avoiding a low middle income trap, because this will bring us into a discussion of industrialization, which is still a development problem. Okay, the motivation. Think 2020, that was the outbreak of the COVID-9 pandemic in 2020, and the challenges that got ushered in, we got the deepest single-year decline in real GDP, widened the budget deficits and enlarged public debt, debt which is what uh, the current administration is grappling with. There uh, was a quarter where the unemployment rate peaked at 17.4%, I think April, and then it was clear also from those who were laid off that the social protection was inadequate. So those are tough challenges. And then this is, a, I call it a story seldom told. Vietnam overtook the Philippines in per capita GDP in 2020. Uh, and up to now, the per capita GDP going by the World Bank indicators, uh, the Philippines continues to trail that of Vietnam. So what we should ask ourselves is how do we navigate 
the economy in the post-pandemic era, which is now, and then avoid a low middle income trap and gear for a bright future. There are immediate challenges. One is the stabilization, as well as the need for a strong public health system. And in the long run, we have to industrialize and make sure that uh, we're able to engage in energy development to be able to come up with affordable electricity rates. And then I open up with a proposal or think about an industrial, new industrial policy, as well as a narrowing down of in income inequality, which is still a major problem also, okay? Here, the story seldom told. Vietnam overtook the Philippines, okay? If you look at these numbers, uh, th those are selected uh, NIEs as well as highly developed uh, modern industrial economy like South Korea, NIEs like Taiwan and Singapore, they're at the top. But if you look at the ASEAN countries here, you've got Malaysia, Thailand, and the Philippines is at the bottom of this array of Southeast Asian countries. This is 2021. That was supposed to be a period of recovery already uh, from uh, the pandemic, okay? But we're here at the bottom. So I think the first question that we ask is, can we get out of that? And here's a head-to-head -head comparison of GDP per capita. It was not always like that because in 2019, prior to the pandemic, the Philippines still had a real GDP per capita higher than Vietnam. But in 2020, for whatever the Philippines did, Vietnam overtook us in terms of the GDP per capita. And then in 2021, Vietnam is still ahead. And then 2022, it's still ahead. So can we still get back the 2019 position? Okay, I think we can. So let's start with uh, what are the challenges in the post-pandemic era that are challenges that are now confronting the current administration? First, the short-run stabilization. Of course, you know that we need a sound deficit financing and public debt management. Whenever you have a deficit and the government borrows to finance that deficit, public debt increases. The response of the current administration is to uh, issue a medium-term fiscal framework, or MTFF, uh, for the period 2023 to 2028. Uh, of course, uh, when you look at the objectives in bullet two, you want to reduce the deficit to GDP to 3% by 2028, and debt to GDP ratio to less than 60% by 20 under the MTFF. So what do you need to do there? Get rid of waste, wasteful spending in the budget, and then raise some recurrent taxes that are easy to administer and pray progressive, okay? So that one, if you want to do that over 2020, the period 2023 to 2028, it's very important to be able to forge a budget accord with Congress beyond one year, because all taxes emanate from the House. Can we do that? Okay. Uh, and then if you want to reduce the deficit to GDP ratio to 3%, which many people believe is safe, uh, but as you do a deficit reduction program, it's got to be a responsible one, meaning we have to protect the core Filipino values at the very least in health, education, and shelter, and then make sure that we're able to modernize and expand the infrastructure, okay? Because those are all impeding economic growth in the country. Now, why uh, do we need to improve the public health system? You know, we have a, a UHCA, right? Universal Healthcare that was passed in I believe 20, 2019. And we know that it's important to have investments in health or in population management if uh, we're going to believe the columns of earning. Uh, we know the impacts already of COVID-19, but there could be some other communicable diseases that could intervene. And that generally 
increases morbidity and absenteeism in the workplace. So we've got to reduce that to raise labor productivity and eventually total factor productivity. And then we know the incidence of unemployment really rose for the young workers, the youth. And they, for while unemployed, they forgo a lot of human capital. And unless we are able to rectify that, give them new skills, what will happen is that the young unemployed today will become the adult unemployed tomorrow. So we don't want that. And then meanwhile, there's a lot of things going on. There is automation, robotics, chatbot, etc. So we need some upskilling of our workers. Okay, and then uh, strengthening public health system. I think the solution is still to pursue the herd immunity, with enhanced vaccination rates. And of course, because UHCA spells or provides for mandatory enrollment in field health, let's make sure we get the sufficient financing for field health, including eliminating corruption, and then monitoring, evaluation, and doing mid-course corrections. I hope NEDA does it through the Social Development Committee, another IAC, uh, usually chaired by the social agencies. And then affordable energy costs, let me draw attention to a book published, edited by Maharavago, James Romaset, as well as Rolly Dana, our one of our emeritus professors here, saying that we still got a problem with our energy. Industrialization, aside from the useful requirements, calls for the replacement of human effort by electricity and mechanical power. So if that is not affordable, that will impede industrialization. So now we have to accelerate the cost competitiveness of renewables. I call it an emission constrained economy because the Philippines has succeeded to the Paris Agreement, the COP21 uh, signed in Paris. So we have to submit our national determined contribution there. And we need to make sure that renewables become cost competitive if we hope to replace, uh, let's say, fossil fuels in generating, for one, electricity and in transport. And then we've got to have strategies on how to transit from coal to renewables in power generation. They put natural gas in the mix, but that's also a fossil fuel, but lower emission. GHG, greenhouse gas emission. So let's also roll out a program for clean transport and then revisit the regulatory framework under EPIRA for possible amendment. We have not amended the EPIRA since it's, it was enacted in 2001, so it's now on its 22nd year. So I think revisiting it is a good move and then be able to introduce some amendments because Several voices are crying out for an amendment to the APIRA law. And then demand management may be considered peak load pricing in electricity. And then what do we have to do to transform the economy through industrialization? First, we have to raise productivity in all sectors, agriculture, industry, and services. People think it's just building uh, the heavy industries that are uh, the usual, the, for example, denizens of import substitution. No, the smokestack industries uh, are not just part of, are not just to replace uh, agricultural enterprises, but agricultural enterprises must also become productive. And then uh, we have to be careful because industrial policy, if we are to consider it, we may have to be careful in choosing the industries to support and uh, the insights that we get from the usual uh, scholars. There's learning by doing, there's increasing returns to scale, and re uh, scale economies are realized as a result. Then of course, that will require in expanding an educated manpower, a managerial class, as well as an entrepreneurial class, and we notice this with all of the 
millennials uh, doing startups, uh, there seems to be a movement toward developing that entrepreneurial class, but they will need specialized education and training. And then we hope to be able to reduce electricity rates paid by household and industry, read uh, Ravago, Romaset, and Danao, powering the Philippine economy. And then we are hearing about countries that have really adopted an industrial policy, meaning there's government support, starting with the edition by Stiglitz and Yusuf, published by the World Bank, Rethinking the East Asian Miracle. It's talking about an industrial policy. And then, of course, we hear about Roderick a lot of times these days and his uh, new industrial policy in the 21st uh, century. Okay. And then I'd like to bring out uh, about curbing or ending rising income inequality, whether you go by the Gini ratio or just comparing uh, income received by the top income deciles and the low income, it's been widening. So, and there are several studies now that income inequality is very harmful to growth. Uh, I recommend particularly the Thomas Piketty book, a bestseller, that came out in 2016, or something like that. Uh, the uh, uh, Capitalism, a history, a long history, and he says there that capital accumulation gets, leads to a concentration of wealth in the wealthy class, and that's not good for development. You cannot build a modern industrial society if it gets unequal all that across the years. And then make sure that we are able to adopt a decent and productive employment because there are these new perspectives on job strategies. Evans and Spriggs are already talking about the reversal by the OECD away from pure labor market flexibility to looking at the institutions towards employment protection, inclusivity, etc. And that's the OECD, very influential organization, the Richmond's Club. And then here, I think it's very important for PSA to already release, release data on wages and compensation so that more scholars will be able to study income distribution. Okay, to sum up, uh, navigating the present, let me just start by saying, because we inherited all of the tough development challenges from the previous administration, definitely EJK, HR violations, we're happy about the uh, Maria Ressa decision, of course. Spoiled vaccines, family, field health scams, those are bad building blocks for a modern industrial society. We have to eschew them, okay? And then lessons from the past. There is no such thing as infinite borrowing. It's not sustainable. There's no such thing as a widow screws of loanable funds, meaning non-exhaustible. Uh, funds to be loaned out in international markets. And then we have to start thinking about eliminating wasteful spending. This can only be done if you have a budget accord lasting beyond one year with the, with the Congress. And then I hope we have to do a impact, I think time to do a the impact analysis of both the train that tax reforms for what, inclusive growth, or accelerated and inclusive growth, and then create this corporate recovery and tax incentives. I think there's already enough data to show whether or not they have achieved there or they're just tax eroding. So let's see, I think, impact analysis and then start a tax reform study well, that will yield, I hope, really good results. And then there were the bright future outlook. Let's try to break the $4,000 middle income barrier. That's the definition of the word bank. That's the middle income threshold. And then see if we can overtake Indonesia and Vietnam. Because once you hit the $4,000, you'll never know how enterprises will behave, how entrepreneurs will behave. And then the new plan, Philippine Development Plan, if you've seen it, calls for deep economic transformation as well as deep social transformation. I think you can do that. There's a big role for government in there. 
So you got to have an industrial policy, and then you have to improve income distribution. Last word. My final word said that I think it's still important, industrial policy for knowledge production. We've got to move to a knowledge economy, the Philippines. School of Economics is doing its job in economics, but we need also more institutions doing work, doing the heavy lifting in improving science, technology, math, and engineering. We need those. So, since this is PCE, the lecture, so it can continue its role, I think, to assist knowledge production in economics and then spreading it. And I'm glad, I think we know that we've got other institutions of higher learning now that are really producing top-notch graduates. Ateneo Economics Department, La Salle, USD. Uh, these are good trends as far as uh, uh, producing uh, uh, a skilled manpower base with strong economic uh, skills. And then U UPSC will have to continue doing advanced research in economics, produce the highly trained graduate who can be deployed to government as well as in the private sector. I'm a member of a better group called ACON 70s so or something like that. And uh, it's very, I'm pleasantly surprised to see very accomplished graduates there in the private sector in particular. And then NEDA, I think this is uh, a big task for NEDA. In the context of the industrialization and avoiding getting married in a low middle income trap, I think it will have to improve its monitoring and evaluation beyond the uh, physical as well as the financial accomplishments. But are we industrializing? Let's look at what's happening to productivity. Is there diversity in all the various industries? Are we seeing innovation in all of them? Is there such a thing as inclusivity, like ending income inequality? And then I do believe in building a research culture, work with the DOST and NAST in financing R&D in science and technology. I think I'll pause here. I've uh, consumed my 40 minutes. And uh, I don't want to stand in the way of my uh, accomplished discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Canlas. Now, to help us further enrich our discussion on the subject matter, I'd like to introduce our discussants for today. We have three of them, but the first one is Dr. Jesus Estanislao. He is currently the chairman of the Center for Excellence in Governance and is a visiting professor at Instituto de Estudios Superiores de la Empresa in Spain. He was the founding chairman of Institute of Corporate Directors and Institute for Solidarity in Asia and also served in government as Minister of Finance and as Economic Planning Secretary during the presidency of Corazon Aquino. Uh, his career in banking was capped by his appointment as chairman and CEO of the Development Bank of the Philippines, which he rehabilitated in 1986 to 1989. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Jesus Estanislao is joining us via Zoom. Dr. Estanislao, go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it was very good to hear to listen to the good comments talking about the All right, we're having some uh, technical difficulties. Uh, are we gonna fix or move on to our next discussant first? I don't think he realized we can't hear him. Hi, Dr. Oh, there. Hi, Dr. Stanislaw, we're trying to fix the audio. Uh, just a minute. All right, so we have three discussants. 
the beauty of technology. Are we ready? Okay, maybe we move to our next discussant for now, while we fix the technical issues uh, with the connection with Dr. Jesus Stanislao. Our next, our second discussant, our first in this case, is Dr. Joseph T. Yap. He was president of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, where he worked for 26 years until his retirement in June 2013. Sir? Uh, thank you very much, Mimi. Uh, at, the out, at the onset, I would like to express my gratitude to PCED, uh, particularly uh, Prof. Joy Abrenka, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, uh, for inviting me to be a discussant. I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate Professor Dante Canas, not only for the insightful paper, but also on his career as a teacher researcher and policy maker. I begin my discussion, uh, how does PowerPoint? <laughs> okay. I begin my discussion uh, with the comparison of the Philippines and Vietnam. Uh, there are two reasons for this. One is that uh, it played a prominent role in the paper of Professor Kalnas. Uh, and second, it's a selfish reason. Uh, I spent the whole month of December last year uh, writing a paper on why the Vietnam overtook the Philippines. And that's the basis for my comments. Uh, by the way, I choose the year, or I chose the year 2021, and not 2020 when the switch actually took place because of, of the even impact, economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And if you look at the graph or, or the table, uh, even if we use gross national income, uh, which means that we take into account overseas remittances, you still see the same pattern. Now, Vietnam is just the latest in a series of what I would describe or what I described in the paper as debacles. So if you look at World Bank data, 1960 up to 2022, okay, it's available online, free. Korea overtook us in 1964. Thailand overtook us in 1985. Indonesia in 1993. China in 1998 and of course Vietnam in 2021. So, can this be attributed to policy failures? Let me rephrase it in a more positive way. Uh, despite all the good intentions, some of them presented by Professor Kalnas, described as greatest hits, why did the Philippines still fall behind? Okay, so if we exclude first Korea, from this list. I point out to a double whammy, which largely explains the last four countries. Okay, first aspect of the double whammy, FDI from Japan. Okay, we missed the rising tide. Our boat was weighed heavily by different factors and we missed the rising tide from Japanese FDI. So, and by the way, this was a push factor, not a pull factor, a sharp appreciation of the yen. Okay. So, Philippines did not benefit as much as Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, eventually China and Indonesia. So you have the 83-85 BOP crisis, which Dante explained well. And I have a footnote in my paper, I still wonder, why is it only the Philippines and the Asian countries succumb to the uh, credit, to, uh, the uh, push for foreign credit. Okay, that's a different story. 
then the 86-89 political transition, and then 89-93 power crisis, and then in the 90s, the emergence of China and Vietnam. Okay, so we missed the boat. Well, there was a trickle, but we definitely missed the boat. Okay. Second aspect of the double whammy, we embark on an economic liberalization program starting, well, Butch Montes says 1984. But anyway, let's stick with that. From a position of weakness. Plus, we had a fixation on repaying the external debt. Okay, so this is one chart that will describe it. And I sometimes say that we protected too long and liberalized too fast. And you can see that, for example, Thailand uh, had higher tariffs, okay, and then we brought our tariffs way below to 4.8%. And and crisis-based reform. Doi Moi of Vietnam definitely a strategy-based reform. In our case, it was a crisis-based reform. And uh, thus, uh, countries, other countries practice industrial policy more effectively. They control their destiny. As you can see, that we brought our tariffs down too fast. Okay, so the double whammy will explain why it took us 20 years to regain the 1982 per capita GDP. Uh, Mexico, it took them only about a decade, which was, the, Mexico was the epicenter of the international debt crisis in the 80s. It took them about 30, 10, 13 years. It took us two decades. Okay, so why is it, despite all these proactive reforms since 1982, why did we still fall behind? And falling behind, let me summarize it with just one chart. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay. The investment GDP ratio, one of my favorite uh, indicators. Uh, three things about this chart. Number one, uh, compared to the other countries included in this chart, China, Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, India, uh, we were generally in the bottom. We are the red line, okay? For the better part of three decades, we are the lower part of investment GDP ratio. So Y equals C plus I plus G, investment is important for future economic growth. And we were, uh, uh, we fell back or we were in the back seat with regard to investment GDP. Second, it's not shown here, but among the ASEAN plus three countries, okay, only the Philippines and Cambodia never touched or reached the 30% threshold, which is a rule of thumb recommended by the World Bank and other agencies. We never reached that threshold from 1960 to 2019. Only the Philippines and Cambodia so, Lao PDR, Myanmar, okay, Vietnam. Third thing that you can observe, okay. Uh, thank you, Rose, for the data. 2000 to, to, Rose Edilion, 2000 to 2015, general government construction was 3% of GDP. Okay, 2000 to 2015. The data is not in the chart. It, uh, it was supplied to me. Okay, so build, 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 2016 to 2019. After build, build, build for three years or four years, from 3.3%, it reached a whopping 4.1%. Okay, well, sorry for the sarcasm. Well, well it re did reach 5.5% in 2022, but that's because we reduced the denominator, okay, to increase the ratio. Uh, in contrast, government investment in Vietnam from 1997 to 2015, data obtained from Butch Montes, was 6.3% of GDP. Okay? Malaysia was, is about 
So despite our goal to reach 11%, as I remember from the build, 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 okay, nothing. So my friend, uh, my Vietnamese friend, uh, Dr. Ngo Hui Liem, in 2012 when we had lunch, he summarized the reason why we've, we have fallen behind. That was in 2012. He said to me, Philippine policymakers are very good in co conceptualizing policies and programs. Uh, he even candidly admitted that Vietnam would copy some of these policies and programs, but we are weak in implementation. The opposite is true for Vietnam. And this brings us to the area of political, political economy, where we talk about weak institutions, soft state, Gunnar Myrdal, soft state, uh, due to the dominance of oligarchs, cronies, and political dynasties. And my analysis, okay, I stated this about more than a decade ago. We have a gridlock where stronger institutions are necessary to loosen the grip of the oligarchs and political dynasties, but at the same time, the influence of oligarchs and political dynasties must be reduced to strengthen institutions. And I fur further contend, after the last elections, I further contend that this gridlock has led to a vacuum where we have a lack of accountability. And contrast this to Vietnam, taking from Fermin Adriano's article, Vietnam has a corporatist approach where failure to meet targets will lead to the replacement, transfer, or disqualification of the respective heads and others who are answerable. As my friend, Mario Lamberta said, in this country, lawbreakers become lawmakers. Oops, sorry. But anyway, so I end by saying, abruptly, I admit, sorry for the abrupt ending, but more attention has to be given to political governance reforms with the aim of generating more accountability. With that, as my mother-in-law would say, just Nina. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yap. Our next discussant is Mr. Diwa Guinigundo. He served the BSP for 41 years and served as a deputy governor for the monetary stability sector. He was also alternate executive director at the IMF in Washington, D.C. from 2001 to 2003. He currently chairs the advisory panel of the ASEAN Plus Three Macroeconomic Research Office based in Singapore. That's for 2023 to 2025. And he has a weekly column uh, for Manila Bulletin and Business World. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Diwa Guinigundo. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Mimi, and thanks for this uh, invitation. It's my pleasure to react to Dr. Dante Canla's lecture this afternoon on uh, avoiding low-middle income trap, lessons learned from the NEDA and the Academy. Dr. Canlas is my uh, professor in econometrics, Econ 131. And I thought he would give me a tree because I failed to submit a paper to him. And the reason was, you know, at that time, we were depending on uh, uh, <clears throat> response cards, which we bring to the statistical center for processing. And uh, it takes us about three or four days before we get the initial result of the simple regression analysis. The problem was, I spilled the cards. And so it took time for me to do it, but at that time, the dead, it was past deadline. But uh, Dr. Canlas was very forgiving. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> With a maximum of eight minutes to do this reaction, let me quickly say that I agree with Dr. Canlas that many factors do drive long, long-run economic growth, including accumulation of physical and human capital, as well as technological progress. I also note that um, his three policy approaches in bringing about a possible, I stress possible, breakthrough to a high middle income economy, namely short run stabilization measures, health measures, and of course, affordable energy. If we may add, the evidence is also available that growth may be impeded by aging demographics as well as political economy, including the rule of law, size of government, the regulatory environment. And there is also an increasing evidence to the contrary. Those who escape the middle income trap exhibit higher growth at all relative income, higher total factor productivity, faster transformation toward industry, export orientation, and of course, as Dr. Carlas pointed out, better macroeconomic management. I thank Dr. Canlas for pointing out the role of institutions for growth and development, the importance of having good industrial policy, and the need to ensure that we don't ignore the imperative of reducing poverty and income inequality. In advancing these causes, it is crucial that we avoid corruption. Yes, corruption does not create wealth. It simply transfers wealth to those with plenty of it already. And this is enabled by those who wield political power. We are in a bigger trouble when economic and political power converge in only one hand. But governance definitely is not growth positive. What else is our problem? Breaking out of the middle income trap, that situation of economic stagnation and failure to advance to a high income level. A few examples may be useful, and uh, Job <clears throat> actually made some of these uh, assertions in his tables and charts. After graduating from law to lower middle income in 1999, China reached upper middle income status in 2010, a gap of only 11 years. Indonesia went back and forth from low to lower middle in the 1990s, but finally consistently made it as a lower middle income country in 2003 and became upper middle income in 2019, a gap of 16 years. Thailand, Malaysia, and the Philippines were all classified as lower middle income countries in 1987, but Malaysia graduated to upper middle classification in 1992, or a short gap of only five years while well, Thailand joined the group in 2010. Meanwhile, the Philippines appears to have a perpetual engagement with the lower middle income category and has remained as such until today. It should not surprise us anymore to know that as early as 2020, Vietnam achieved a real per capita GDP higher than the Philippines. Vietnam's recorded history is more of war than peace until about 50 years ago. Vietnam does not rank high in freedom indices, and it was only fairly recently that introduced political and economic reforms. And it does not exactly take pride in speaking good English. We don't think we were doing something too different from the rest. As Dr. Canlas pointed out, the Philippines also decided to leverage on the benefits of a more liberalized global trading regime under the WTO when we acceded in the mid-1990s. Our peers were also journeying on the same path. Our growth path trended up. Our total factor productivity also climbed up. But despite these marked improvements, the Philippines compared to its peers was not able to take full advantage of globalization. In the 10 years since the WTO was established in 1995, annual real value of goods and services exports increased by 180% in the Philippines. 
Very impressive. But we lag behind the 200% in Malaysia and Thailand and the 585% in Vietnam. 20 years after the WTO started, annual real value of goods and services exports increased by 290% in the Philippines, but 315% for Thailand and more than 1,600% for Vietnam. I have to say that this situation was due to our weak policy actions. So in terms of implementation, we really lag behind. But we are good in imagination. We are good in conceptualization. Our neighbors also took advantage of the liberalizing world economy by attracting foreign investors. But while the Philippines retained its restrictive measures and discouraged investors with its poor infrastructure and high power rates, its peers attracted foreign direct investments to help them bridge their capital gap, develop the private sector, and provide employment. In the 10 years before the pandemic, average annual FDI net inflows in current U.S. dollars was $5.9 billion for the Philippines, much lower than the $9.1 billion for Thailand, $11.2 billion for Vietnam, and $19.4 billion for Indonesia. While we are in the same game of attracting foreign investment in our respective economies, our neighbors put substance to slogans and logos, investment roadshows and official visits. They strengthen their infrastructure and market-friendly investment policies. They rationalize their, pow their power, water, and other public facilities. Now, we are also trying to do the same, as much as we could, but obviously, they were not enough. We have a lot of catching up to do. At this point, I want to, one, further emphasize the role of institutions, and two, whether we could leverage on global value chains, or GVCs, to accelerate growth and perhaps escape from the many years in the middle income trap. We cannot overemphasize that good governance and institutions play a very important role, not just in improving a country's investment climate, but also in promoting overall sustainable growth. Inclusive institutions create incentives for people to innovate, enable productivity growth through education and infrastructure, and maintain peace and order, which are all essential in creating an environment that is conducive to sustainable and self-sustaining growth. In contrast, extractive institutions or those that catered to oligarchic interests tend to result in poverty and stagnant growth. I believe we are here in this situation. Singapore's experience showed that good governance, not less governance, is a successful approach in addressing the challenges of economic inequality, environmental degradation, and even terrorism. Their focus on good governance showed that non-economic factors could matter more than economic factors for a successful takeoff of an emerging economy. On the possible use of upgrading our industries along global value chains, there is a growing body of literature that argued that global value chains effectively denationalize comparative advantage of some key economies, which could possibly allow countries to industrialize by joining GVCs rather than by building on their own. In other words, that could be complementary to developing its own industry, but that could accelerate the pace of industrialization. This is considered to be a strategic pillar, especially for emerging markets to achieve greater competitiveness develop high-level skills and human capital of their labor force and to acquire technology to advance their current levels of industrialization to be able to climb to higher value-added production. GVCs are powerful driver of productivity growth, work creation, and higher 
living standards. GBC countries tend to grow faster, import skills and technology, and boost jobs. There are empirical issues surrounding this proposition, of course, but it looks like some countries have already started to leverage on this recent innovation in a big way to accelerate economic growth. It is no different from having some macroeconomic goals of sustainable growth and lower inflation and implementing all actionable programs and projects that would produce the desired results. In aiming for GBC participation, emerging markets could hope to escape the middle income trap by taking action to devise and implement policies that would enhance the institutional, macroeconomic, trade, and industrial policies required for a successful GVC participation. This would require establishing and strengthening the links between production and distribution and between economic and social change. This would focus and nuance the economic framework for a successful GBC participation and in the process, overcoming the obstacles to an economic breakthrough to higher income trajectory. This is an important point because the middle income trap is supposed to occur when growing emerging markets with rising wages try to sustain economic momentum based on labor-intensive manufacturing and exports. Over time, however, they are likely to experience declining competitive advantage and demand. GVC participation is considered promising because they could lead to higher productivity, higher output, and higher value added through five main channels of transmission. Backward and forward links, pro-competitive market restructuring, technology spillovers, minimum scale achievements, and labor market effects. The global community becomes the entire output for, for design, for production, marketing, distribution, and even promotion, wherever the value added are most competitive. Of course, the challenge here is to make sure that we establish risk management system to forestall any possible disruption in the value chain. Let me quickly summarize my point. There is ample evidence in the literature, for example, Jacob Engel and Daria Taglioni of 2017, that there is nothing overly probable, let alone inevitable, about growth slowdowns at specific incomes. But there are problems related to structural transformation of industries, and they are quite specific to middle-income economies. This being the case, middle-income countries are challenged to adapt to global trade and investment operating through globally integrated value chains in goods, services, and information. If we're able to track those policies that would make GVC participation worthwhile, such macroeconomic, trade, and industrial policies could very well be the answer to addressing the issues that surround economic stagnation and inability to break out of the middle income trap. In this age of AI and algorithms, we might have to engage in the interplay between technological or digital innovation and globalization, or what we call increased connectivity and GVC and in creating an environment conducive to diversification, innovation, and productivity. Let me stop there and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, DG Diwa. Now, I think we're ready for our third discussant, Dr. Jesus Estanislao, joining us live via Zoom. So yes, we're going to. Are we on? Can yes, you see me? Can you hear me? we are on, sir. We can hear you, but hopefully we can see you. <laughs> okay. Can you see us? Yeah, you can okay. see us. Hi, sir. All right. So I think we're ready. Go ahead, sir. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you for the uh, paper of uh, Dr. Canlas and, of course, the comments of Dr. Yao and Governor Diva. I learned quite a lot this afternoon 
The first thing I would like to say is I like to thank Dr. Bernas for building on the platform that Bernard Panorama and myself did in the administration before uh, he came in. Dr. Kandasar in 1992 and 1998, and then later on, during the first uh, couple of years of Gloria Macapagana Arroyo, those were great reform years. I remember Kandasar working on the lessons. And we've gotten reminders, very forceful reminders, from Secretary Kandas about the importance of macroeconomic discipline. All of us are convinced about it, except that today, we seem to have forgotten it in the administration. We keep on. We have to keep inflation low. We have to keep public deficits uh, low and under control. And therefore, the service obligations that we have for our public sector debt should be kept at a prudent ratio in relation to the GDP. All of these things we know. And we've been lecturing uh, on these themes. Uh, in the School of Economics, and the School of Economics in the country. But what we have today is uh, a disregard again for a concern for low inflation. And what do we throw in? Um, price controls. I mean, the Secretary of Finance uh, shocked that the price control regime on rice has been imposed. And we know what it leads to. It leads to eventually uh, higher public sector deficit. What is the solution that we're giving uh, to the price, uh, the price of rice prices? Uh, we're trying to give uh, public subsidies to the retailers who are lost money because of price controls. Again, this goes on and on and on. And this underscores uh, the points that uh, Governor Dewa actually was insisting. And that is, we need to think of two things. One is, let's not forget. GDP is the sum total of all of the economic value added by all of the economic institutions and enterprises in the country. And the key, therefore, is to make sure that we have competitive, highly productive uh, enterprises whose internal value chains are best of class. Uh, we seem to have forgotten that. It is something that we're not pushing ahead. We're talking about all sorts of issues, but this is key, the competitiveness of our individual enterprises. Because don't forget, all of these investment ratios and GDP, those are macroeconomic stuff. They are made up of the individual decisions and the actual situation on the ground with respect to the economic enterprises. But having said that, let me just uh, uh, end with three short notes. One is, uh, let's not give up on the Philippine government. Actually, we've been working with Philippine government institutions. Uh, uh, Dr. Kandas was talking about health. Uh, we have to know that there's a lot of work that is being done by public sector hospitals in this country. Uh, the Philippine Health Center is considered one of the very best in Asia. And our public sector hospitals especially after COVID and through COVID, they're transforming themselves. I can tell you, one of the best, best cases that we have of a reform public sector hospital is the Hosea Memorial uh, Hospital in Central Zone, possibly uh, another one in Cebu, the Vicente Soto Memorial Hospital. And we have about 80 of these public sector hospitals that are trying to address some of the concerns that uh, Professor Kandas has mentioned about avoiding the middle income job. So, uh, one key lesson, let's not depend on the president of the Philippines. Let's not uh, depend only on the national government. There are actually many things that you can do, one institution at a time. Uh, do you know that, for example, the uh, armed services that we have, Philippine Army, Philippine Navy, Philippine Air Force, uh, six, seven years ago, Public perception of them was very low, 26, 27 percent. Now, all of these three uh, uniform services, so all armed forces, have a high public rating of 85, 90 percent, and they're ready to move forward uh, to take on higher national security, security, security risks. Also, with respect to two things, 
We can compete against all of these other countries. My work, for example, in global governance. Is there's no need for the Philippines to be at the bottom of the heap. As a matter of fact, we can be at the top of the heap. In ASEAN, for example, I can tell you, with respect to proper governance, the Philippines is very far from the bottom of the heap. We're very close to being at the top. And by the way, the same thing is true uh, with um, what uh, Governor Lima has been doing us. Uh, I was this morning with the BSP, which is hosting the Alliance for Financial Inclusion. And what is presented there? Philippines is very close to the top when it comes to uh, the programs for financial inclusion. We're not yet up there. We have a lot of work to do, but the commitment is there, the programs are there, the institutions are there. And last thing which I would like to say is that um, productivity in terms of connecting the dots and therefore solidarity and bringing the different sectors and institutions together is key. Now, who is going to do that? Now, in the banking sector, in the financial system, in the financial sector, we have had the privilege of having very good central bank governors since 1993 onwards. And we have one of the best central banks in the region. Now, what we need to do sector by sector is do something like that with an coordinating, integrating, supervisory institution that would be committed to good governance and making the Philippines as competitive as possible. Now, during the Aquino, Aquino administration, we're able to move the Philippines from the lower one third of countries, according to the WEF competitiveness funding, to the middle third. And we're already going to the top of that middle uh, section. And if we could have continued uh, with a greater commitment uh, to industrial, corporate, government competitiveness, there is a possibility for the Philippines to go up to among the top 30 of all the countries in the world. But that is some work that we need to do, and we've got to be smart in terms of strengthening our institutions, our economic enterprises, and working on the internal value chain, as well as the external value chain of which we are all a part. We should continue in governance, with transformation, with productivity, in order to avoid the middle income trap that Professor Pandas is wor worried about. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Stanislaw. I think he's still going to join us for the open forum. Uh, thank you to all of our esteemed discussants. The next part of the program is the open forum. May we now request Dr. Canlas and our discussants to please join us back here on stage. It is a 15 to 20 minute open forum. Uh, it will be open uh, to both on-site and online questions. So for those joining us online, please send us, join us to the discussion, send us your questions via Zoom. For our on-site participants in the middle aisle, you will see microphone stands. Please feel free to approach the microphone stands to either ask a question or raise your comment or opinion about what we've heard today. Um, please just introduce yourself and direct your question. For our online Zoom participants, uh, we'd like to remind you, please send your questions to the account name UPSE Zoom Facilitator. I will be reading the questions and comments during the open forum. Uh, we don't have much time. Uh, so please, we ask all of our discussants, DJ Diwa, uh, Dr. Kanlas, uh, Dr. Joseph, yeah, please join us here. I think Dr. Stanislaw is still on standby via Zoom. All right. So let's make the most of um, the 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> All right. Okay, let me take the other side. Nako, this is my ugly side pa naman. <laughs> okay, I will sit here na lang. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, it's 15 to 20 minutes. Um, so let's make the most of it. Before we... We already have one question lined up. But before that, I want to throw the first question. I want to make sure the question is hard. This is the headline question, Sir Dante uh, Canlas. I know you're very busy, sir. Do you ever Google yourself? Have you ever Googled <laughs> yourself, sir? Me? 
I think I did once just to check what's in there. What did you see? Did uh, my positions in Neda and my position in the university? Yeah. All right. I tried to Google you, sir, about two weeks ago. I clicked news, so it's mostly reference to your work. But when I clicked news, there was one that came out on top. It was a South China Morning Post piece by Miss Raisa Robles. And the title, it was from many, many years ago. The title was Arroyo Under Fire for Letting Go of Economic Planning Chief, Canlas. And in it, Miss Solita Monsod, who was Economic Planning Secretary under former President Aquino said, and I'm quoting the article, she, Mrs. Arroyo, must be punch drunk or desperate. I'm absolutely depressed. It is a wrong move, a wrong signal, and everybody knows it. Why are you going to remove somebody who's done a good job? So this is top of the Google for news under your name, sir. My question is, it's been 20 years, over 20 years. Are you ready to go back to public service? Whether in the position we're expecting for you or in another post. Normally, my answer to that question is, if asked, I'll serve, mm -hmm. OK? Uh, however, I've been looking mostly at developments in government, the policies, et cetera, from outside, from my office here at the uh, School of Economics. And unlike Diwa, my favorite columnist these days, I don't write a blog or a column Although I have a running joke with Romy Bernardo in that <laughs> regard, because he writes a column, mm -hmm. and whenever I compliment him for a column, he writes either, I think it's a once a week kind of column, I would always say, hey, Romy, I love your column today. And it reminds me of the farther away we are from government, the more omniscient we become. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but. That's me. That's you, sir. But I don't write about it. All right, all right. Um, so just just a follow up to that question, uh, Dr. Canlas. You in your presentation you talked about how it's a combination of positive and normative economics, what it is and what it should be, and how some public policy um, issues uh, get caught in the middle of debates among competing interest groups. Looking at today in this situation, what do you think for you? is the single biggest public policy economic issue caught in the middle of in very strong interest groups. And what is your advice? Just very quickly, sir. From outside, I was looking, for example, at the evolution of the uh, Maharlika from a sovereign wealth fund. Mm -hmm. And it became now, under the law, an investment fund. Okay. Which, uh, to me, uh, is already a good progression with some, uh, I am aware of the uh, uh, statement that was signed by some of my colleagues and other economists. Uh, in fact, uh, I think they used a, uh, a phrase from uh, the, our national scientist here, I hope he's watching, uh, Raul Fabella. He said, it's beyond repair. Yeah. Something like that. So, and then they went through that. I didn't sign that second statement anymore. However, the very first version, which was still a sovereign wealth fund, I signed the statement because it was so obvious. You cannot take uh, the membership's uh, funds from SSS and GSIS and put mm -hmm. it in there because uh, those are funds of the members. And, uh, you cannot just put it in some special fund. So I signed that. But then we know that that particular bill, which mm -hmm. emanated from the House, has been totally replaced, I understand, mm -hmm. by the yes. law that got passed. So uh, that's and out already. And I didn't think that uh, I needed to sign any further statement, mm -hmm. especially thinking of uh, re back of my mind always I Raul's uh, okay. warning, it's beyond repair. beyond repair. But I don't know now. I hope it works because we need it. As uh, That's the reason why I chose the title uh, 
and Diwa already said uh, in so many words, we still need very strong financial markets. This is a especially difficult period because there's still turmoil out there mm. and we don't know we can, if we can still uh, attract those investors in the fund. Uh, I really don't know about that maybe. Uh, uh, DIY. I learned a lot incidentally from the discussions today and I always uh, say that the best reward to a teacher is when he, he or she learns from his or her student. That happened to me today. <laughs> learning from Joe wow. and learning from Diwa. I, uh, and also from Jess, the, uh, one of our old guru in the profession, <laughs> old gurus in the profession. All right. Uh, that's why I really pose it like, this is a challenge. What do we do about it? I just hope that more scholars, more policymakers will take an interest in the issue. Because okay. we really need to, I mean, what are we waiting for now to be overtaken by Cambodia or Laos? I hope not. <laughs> All right. I think we're ready to take uh, the first question from the floor. Yes, sir. Uh, please state your name, your affiliation, and direct your question. Hello. Uh, I am Tyron Luzon from Central Escolar University, a student of political science. Uh, I would agree with Mr. Yap in regards on the political issues on economic uh, policy making. So from what we study in the realm of international relations, uh, we've discussed on how the industrial sector of the country had investors left because of uh, the previous administration's uh, policies. For example, the war on drugs, which uh, scared investors off in the first place. So it would be difficult to gain investors for the nation's plans for industrialization, as our reputation has been tarnished during that administration, including the cap on foreign investment in the country and a ridiculous tax bracket for businesses. So, uh, include for that, I agree with Mr. Yap because politics has been a major power player in economic uh, Policy making. Why? I would even, if I would, I could even name political people from Cavite, but you know, to do not attract any issues. Uh, the question stands how are we going to get good solutions from economics uh, of UP when the politicians that we have today are more busy on getting their uh, their wallets filled with public money. All right. I'm not... Who would like to take that question? Eh? Um, Can I just start? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, very interesting question, but I think uh, our two discussants will have ideas on that <laughs> because they did discuss the role of uh, direct uh, foreign investments in Get, helping the country get out of a low middle income trap. So FDI is very important. What's the attitude of the government towards it? Or are they being impeded by the uh, competing interest groups, the oligarchs, etc., that uh, mentioned by Job as well as by uh, uh, Diwa here. So I do think that if you look at the records, and I'm sure Diwa was there when he saw the decline in foreign direct investments, relative to the other countries, the FDI going to the neighboring uh, Southeast Asian countries, we pale in comparison, okay? And uh, I'm sure Diwa is allowed to talk about that. But there are many reasons behind that. I think uh, Joe was the one who said, we're not what strategy oriented. We're responding to cri We have to wait for a crisis before we do that. Apparently, that's not good, I think. And Diwa already said we forget that there are some other complementary policies to be able to attract foreign direct investments. And you know, uh, local savings are not enough to fund the the the. Um, projects that uh, we know NEDA is processing all the time, but we need some FDIs there. 
whether direct, whether it's hot money because that provides liquidity to our stock market. So all of these things will have to happen. Thank you. Um, who would like to take the uh, question? I'll send you a copy of the paper I wrote, so <laughs> it's too long. Uh, but let me just say this. I, I'm still waiting. Well, what's the term? Do ex, ex machina? No. From mana from heaven. Uh, eventually, we will have a leader who will break that gridlock I mentioned. I'm still hopeful. Uh, there, there, there are those kinds of leaders in minor areas, like in economics, we had Dean Encarnacion. Okay. We had the Marine Science Institute, uh, Dr. Ed Gomez. If, if you're not familiar, these are international standards. So I'm still hopeful. That, that's, but I'll give you a copy of my paper. Can I just have a follow-up uh, comment? Uh, okay. Let's let's be real. Uh, politicians in the country are just busy uh, putting PR on their names instead of helping the economy. So thank you very much. All right. Uh, okay. Um, we have uh, Dr. D uh, G Diwa. Would you like to uh, comment? Well, a few a few years ago, uh, the BSP conducted a study on. Uh, the trend of uh, foreign direct investment in the ASEAN 5. And that includes, of course, the Philippines. And uh, <clears throat> in, that, uh, in that study, they found that incentives, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the role of incentives is quite limited, uh, number one. Number two, um, the role of putting up more um, export processing zone also played a minor role. Or even the, the ability of foreigners to own real properties. But what is more important, as shown by that study, is one is the rule of law. Second is the uh, respect for private property. Third is the stability of political as well as economic policies. Because it is often said that uh, here in the Philippines, we change policies in midstream. So, you know, <clears throat> unless uh, you, you do uh, risk management by the day, it's very difficult to cope. So to me, it is important that uh, the political economy is addressed. But who will do that? If you were saying that uh, these politicians are busy doing this and... Uh, and doing that. But I would also like to be hopeful that uh, someday, God permitting, we will come out of this middle income trap or this, uh, or this tragedy of having to repeat the whole cycle over and over again as if we are just starting on, on day one. Because even today, we're still discussing, are we a federalist government or what? Are we, going to, uh, are we going to decentralize more uh, government uh, functions down to the uh, local government units in the, because you have the Mandana's rule by the uh, Supreme Court? I mean, they have the funds, so they would need, uh, uh, they would need the, the national government has to, has to devolve more responsibilities to the local governments. Until today, we are struggling with those very, very basic fundamental issues that should have been resolved on day one. And that was in 1946, when we had the Republic. <laughs> All right, thank you, DG. Um, Dr. Jess, if you have any comments, just raise your hand. We'd be more than happy to. Yes, sir. Yes, I'd like to pitch in with three ideas. First, uh, perhaps we have to agree with all the speakers, unlike the person who just asked the question, to think long term. Uh, we have problems. Every country has problems. Now, if we focus only on the short-term problems and the short-term issues, and we forget about a strategy for a long-term vision that we would like to realize, then we are in trouble. And that's why Ned, I think, has made a good decision of uh, asking us to think about a vision uh, 2040, 
It's a long-term plan. But it means that the country has to pull together on a number of strategic priorities. That's the first thing I would like to come Second, we have to be very careful about generalizations, about politicians. I must say you're not a politician, but I have worked with politicians. Some of them are very good. And by the way, not all uh, political dynasties are bad. I've worked with some of them, and they're very good. I can mention specifically the political dynasty that is now in Bataan. The governor is in Garcia, the congressman is in Garcia, the mayor of Bataan is in Garcia. But that is working uh, for the good of Bataan. The whole clan, the whole family, and uh, it's participatory, it's citizen involvement, and so on. So I'd be very careful about making generalizations against politicians. Third one, what we need to do is to re-read and re-adapt our circumstances. The message of Asimoglu and Robinson, where nations fail, in fact, where nations succeed. And there are eight things that we really have to focus on. You've got to focus on your moral ethical foundations, your political foundations, your sociocultural foundations. Then you have to worry about your human resources and natural resources. And then you have to worry about your three infrastructure, physical, digital, technological, and then finally, economic and financial. Most of us in economics profession are focused mainly on the last, economic and financial. But have we worried about all the other seven? For example, natural resources and human resources, have we looked at them from the perspective of a Philippines 2040-2046? And unless we have that, we have the leadership to give us that vision of what we must be by 2046, 100 years after our independence. Then every one of us will be thinking of which interest to pursue or which politician to criticize. I think what we need to do is to pull together and say, these are the strategies that we have for economics and finance. In the next 20 years or 25 years, what are the things that we really need to accomplish? By the way, in that sector, we have done quite a great deal. But we have done very little on the digital and uh, technological infrastructure. We have done very, very little, as has been mentioned, on the physical infrastructure. And unless we begin thinking about the long-term strategic requirements of the country, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, We'll always be worrying about which politician is corrupt and which uh, administration to support or which policy to criticize. What we need to do is to pull together and say, how do these things? Let's not forget, economics is systems. And all of these issues are systemic. So what we need to do is to throw systemic solutions and therefore governance solutions, transformative solutions to the problems that we have. I really would like to say, be very careful about uh, blanket accusations against certain groups of people and whatever have you, because some of them can be very good, and many times the uh, solutions are with them. Okay. So that's just my uh, two cents worth. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jess. Um, I think we have one more question, and then we'll get to Sir Alex. Uh, but first, yes, sir. Uh, it's good afternoon. Hello. Uh, my name is Yuan Sufisencia. I am from the Department of Political Science. I'm a, I'm a fourth-year student. Uh, to begin, I just want to say congrats to all the speakers and discussants today. I really enjoyed the presentation. What struck a particular emotional chord to me, I believe, was the mention that Vietnam over has already overtaken us. To imagine we as a people used to believe we were better than them, that's something that strikes into me. And Indonesia, we import planes and trains from them. So. I truly weep to see the day we send our OFWs to there. So in light of what Sir Estenla was saying on systems thinking, um, I do have three questions in mind, and then anyone can answer. All so right. the first one is, what are the systemic and policy flaws that hinder government investment? Is this a matter of the procurement law, overlapping and muddled jurisdictions, or is it inefficient bureaucracy? Second, how do we strengthen our institutions? What specific reforms do we need to have in place to strengthen the state's capacity to herald in and implement these industrial policies to make our nation wealthy? And how do we reduce the power of oligarchs realistically without risking capital flight? 
So I ask all of these because I truly want to know how we can enrich this nation for the better. Okay, uh, three quick questions. Maybe uh, who'd like to take the questions? Any of our discussants or maybe Doc? Okay, go ahead, DJ. Yeah. Well, I will try to answer those uh, three questions with one, with one comment, okay? I think if the government will just carefully read our existing official documents, like the, um, uh, the Ambition 2040, this is a long-term uh, long development plan, good until 2040. And even the, the Philippine Development Plan 2022, or 2023 up to 2028. If we take a look at uh, those, at least those two documents and try to implement them to the letter with strong political will, I don't think we will make a mistake in the sense that those policies, especially in the Philippine Development Plan, everything there is, uh, is disclosed, everything is spelled out, including the legislative agenda, which means this is what Congress should do to pursue development in the areas of health, education, technology, digitalization, etc. One example will be uh, education. We know for a fact that uh, during, the, the, during the pandemic, there's a serious scarring among our students. Okay? And what kind of students are we talking about several years from now? They will be the ones entering the labor force. And they need upskilling, reskilling, upgrading of skills, etc. Now, unless we do that and put our money where our mouth is in terms of the budget, I don't think we would be able to reverse that, 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 that problem as far as education, just, just for education, is concerned. Put more budgetary allocation to what the Philippine Development Plan is saying. I think it's, it's, it's clearly spelled out in, 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 that, in that document. And if uh, both the executive and the, and the legislative branches of government would just you know, study the documents and implement and pursue, especially the legislative agenda, I think we will be in the right, uh, in the right path. Thank you. All right, uh, any more? Anyone from our, would like? Thanks, Lau. Uh, that is very correct. The uh, government will have to do that. And I hope that there will be a system of monitoring and actual reporting of accomplishments based on uh, the targets that have been set. Okay, that's, that, that needs to be done. But let's not forget, government is a very small percentage of the entire nation. Government is a very small percentage of the economy. So while it is policy making, much of the economy, much of what is going on, is really with us individuals. And so what they talk about is a complement to good governance, and that is responsible citizenship. And this is something that we need to really emphasize, because it strikes at the very uh, social cultural foundations of the country. What is it that we Filipinos would like to accomplish, and very much in our own, working together with other groups, what is it that we can accomplish for our local communities, for our regions, for the competitiveness of our respective industries? Unless we get more Filipinos to think in terms of nation and what we can do, of course, coordination, coordination coming from government, then we'll always be discussing what next, what next, what next, what else we have to do. So two things I would really like to leave with you. Good governance that has been emphasized by all the speakers, but a very important complement that would be responsible citizenship. I think with that, we can build a great country. All right. Dr. Erkenlas? Uh, I just want to follow up on some of the points already raised by Job and uh, Diwa on the, uh, trying to attract more foreign direct investments. Diwa, for example, cited a study where uh, it's uh, really important to look at things that normally the Philippines seems to be paling in comparison with the others, rule of law, stability of policies, etc. So I think uh, that will be part of the system, right? Uh, you've got to have a legal and judicial system that is uh, geared to contract enforcement. 
And once uh, contractual disputes uh, emerge, you will have to be able to address those disputes fairly, systematically, and at the same time, quickly, I hope. And we all know stories of some uh, investors that suddenly find that their contracts are being terminated by government with some mandates from the Supreme Court. So that's not good for us because uh, the, the next guy, like a Fraport, will just go back and say, don't deal with the Philippines. They just changed the rules midstream, something like that. So, and uh, Job also mentioned some of those instances where it, it's, when you say it's a system, it's also a system of, it's a process because it's not just one activity there that you try to address, but you have to have some complementarity with some other sectors, particularly the global chain that uh, uh, valuation or what that uh, Diwa mentioned. Oh, we've seen how during the pandemic we were able to, some sectors or some sectors were able to introduce digitalization and they managed, they did very well. And that seems to be continuing. You can now have your, uh, whatever commodity you want to deliver to a friend by calling up Grab or Lala Move. I think that's a good uh, sign, but it should not just be one particular sector. See how you can spread that kind of knowledge because there's learning by doing and to the extent that you can spread it all out to many sectors, that will always produce economic growth, okay? So I think knowledge production is very important. I already mentioned, I think, we have to give science and technology a chance in many of these things. All right, thank you, Dr. Dante. Uh, Mr. Alex Escucha, I think, uh, has a question or... Uh, all right, oh, one more. Hi, ma'am. Uh, hi, uh, I have to uh, ask the question ahead of Alex. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me introduce myself first. I'm Ofi Temple. I'm an ex-Nedan. Oh. So uh, I'm very uh, elated to see my former bosses, Dr. Jess Sanislaw, I don't know if you still remember me, sir. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and then, of course, Dr. Canlas. I've worked with Dr. Canlas for more than 10 years, nine years. Uh, so my question, well, first of all, I really enjoyed listening to all of you. And I'd like to zero in on the question, uh, on the point raised by Jobs. And Jobs, of course, is a friend also, uh, about, in, about the fact, about why we are behind uh, Vietnam, okay? And the fact that, uh, you know, weak institutions, I've been hearing weak institutions uh, mentioned by the three of you, and even Dr. Stanislaw. And what I like with what Dr. Stanislaw said is uh, he pinpointed measures to strengthen institutions. Because my frustration as an economist, reading economist's work, is that we always mention weak institutions, but we never concretize what it meant. So my question is, if you're president of the Philippines, okay, what would be your, what would be your topmost measure to strengthen institutions? Because if you think you're talking about weak policies, diba? But weak policies are made by the bureaucracy. And the bureaucracy now, I mean, is there are ways of you know, strengthening also the bureaucracy now. But what would be your number one, I know, number one maybe policy or measure that you will do to address that point that we are weak implementers, we are wishy-washy in our policies, etc. All right, thank you, ma'am. The Miss Universe question. Uh, maybe we have all the gentlemen answer it, but very quickly, maybe one to two lines. Uh, let's start with Dr. Ria. Uh, there was one time I was sitting down and I realized in order to have strong institutions, in order to strengthen your institutions, you must have strong institutions. It's roundabout, right? Even Roderick mentioned that in one of his talks. Uh, it's really a difficult question to answer, but okay. If I were president, right, uh, we don't have enough time, but <laughs> I would try to use my, to implement what's in the, the anti-dynasty clause in the constitution, put that to work. 
And then my father always said this example, uh, if I were president, uh, and then I heard it later on from Ed Campos himself. Um, I will train a cadre of maybe military men, bright military men, right? And then once they're trained, next day I will replace people in customs and BIR. Just like that. I mean, that, that can be done. Train them in secret, right? And then when, when they're ready, on that day, just tell the BIR people and customs people, please leave your posts. You're going to be replaced. All right. Okay, nakakatakot pala mag-work under you, sir. <laughs> Gulatan. All right. Um, DG. I will make sure that the civil service uh, rules are respected. <clears throat> because right now, a uh, cabinet member can bring in 20 undersecretaries and 20 assistant secretaries. So the rule of uh, merits or meritocracy has been thrown out. And this is one of the reasons why perhaps this is what is happening to us today. You have to cut your teeth into the civil service. You have to imbibe public service as a culture. And I think uh, when the civil service rules are followed and uh, strictly uh, and, st and, and, and followed to the letter, I think that's one good start. Okay. Second, uh, I will lead by example. Okay. I will, uh, well, <clears throat> without alluding to anyone, <laughs> I will keep the budget of, the, of my office to the minimum. Okay. And I will uh, discourage, if not prevent, people from uh, having their own, you know what funds I'm talking about, you know. <laughs> And, you know, pursue public service as it has been <laughs> pursued like before. All right. you know? And use the budget wisely. Uh, if I enjoy supermajority in both the Philippine Senate and the House of Representatives, I will instruct them to make sure that the budget is given only uh, to what, uh, let's say, the Philippine Development Plan is saying are the priorities of government are the priorities of social, economic uh, uh, development. And I think uh, that's one way of starting it. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's hear from Dr. Jess and then Dr. Dante. Dr. Jess, if you were president, what's the first order of business? If I were president, what I'd like to do is articulate what I'd like to see done in six years. My vision for the next six years. And then I'll appoint permanent members who in fact will do the specifics of the broad overall six-year transformation program for the Philippines. And I will hold them accountable. Every three months, six months, one year, I'd like them to be reporting what have you done based on your commitments. And I want this to cascade down to the last bureau, the last office, so that in fact the entire government works together following a vision that must be realized within a certain timetable. And the budgets will come, the organizational uh, mechanisms will be established. But the idea is to have a very clear vision and have the entire cabinet work together to implement that vision. And then exercise the leadership to rally the entire Filipino nation and say, this is what we need to accomplish as a people and as a country in the next six years. And it will be the program. It will be their progress because they have made a contribution not only to the thinking, but they will ask, what can you do to begin implementing initiatives and taking five steps of programs that will contribute to the realization of our vision in the next six years? All Thank right. You. All right, uh, President Jess, President Dante, what are you going to do? Quickly, one uh, specific uh, institutional reform that I really like is, uh, not because DY is here, is the, um, establishing the independence of the Banco Central. I think if uh, we've done a lot of studies ever since they adopted rules like inflation targeting, that has helped improve the, uh, the overall economy at the 
very aggregate level. So uh, I would like something like that. Maintain the independence. So that's your question now. Can we see maintain independence for long? Maybe Diwa can give us the answer, but that's very important. And then number two, I, on a very general plane, I think if I were president, I would concentrate on what we call economies, called the social over capital. Strengthening that, these are the public institutions like the uh, military and the police. I don't want to understand how your entire PNP hierarchy is involved in the drug trade and nothing is being done about it. Yeah. And then you have a military that continues to red tag student leaders. I don't understand that and I don't want that. So these things, those are the institutions. Those are prerequisites to building, uh, let's say, make, just breaking the 4,000 US dollar barrier. Can we break out of it? And then, because you'll never know what happens if you break the 4,000 dollar barrier. The other enterprises, other sectors will all respond in a certain way that I think are very positive. Um, so let's break that in the short run. And then, then the core values in uh, education, in health. There's a, an, ar an article that's circulating in social media about how Vietnam's schools are really doing very well because all of their students or pupils at the lower levels are doing very well in international uh, performance uh, kind of surveys. They do well in math, English, and in science. So you need that as a building block for a modern industrial society. So that's very important. And can we rethink uh, what really happened with our distant learning during uh, two years of the pandemic? Some people are telling me the mothers in public schools say, their children didn't learn anything mm. from distant learning. Well, you ask some who are enrolled their children in the uh, richy private schools, they say they didn't have any problem there uh, because they've got the resources to yeah. complement whatever uh, resources are being spent of them in their schools. But then what about our uh, students in the public schools? If you put them in an international competition, Will they do very well in science or math? That's, uh, we have to see whether or not we have to, you know, do some programs right. that will enable them to watch. All thank right. You. All right, thank you. Sir, I think we're ready for Mr. Alex Escucha. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle Christel, <laughs> my favorite anchor. Uh, I'm Alex Escucha, President of IDEA and Chairman of the UP Visayas Foundation. Uh, when Dante and I were in a FAEA conference uh, about 17 years ago uh, in Singapore, the question of uh, middle, middle income is already there. It's been discussed uh, all these uh, 20 years. And there are two dimensions to that. One is uh, increasing our aggregate per capita to the middle income level. The second aspect of this is also being referred to by economists in India, in uh, Indonesia, for example, about uh, very high income, the high income inequality disparity between the high income class, the top percentile, the bottom. And uh, the phenomenon, as, as described by Joff, uh, the phenomenon being described as the missing middle. In other words, we don't have a real middle class. No? So, mababa na yung average natin, tapos even yung middle class within our cohort is also missing. And as a, a sociologist and political scientist would say, a strong middle class is a stable foundation for a real democratic uh, 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 base. No? Who can make the right... Uh, uh, choices in elections. But if you have too many people who are poor, who just are just willing to sell their votes, then that's a vicious cycle. Uh, going back to the title of this talk, uh, escaping the low middle income class trap and lessons. So escaping from, from these two, two dimensions of a, a middle income trap and the lessons, 
There are two lessons that I would like to point out. The Marcos experiment in putting an industrial base through the 11 major industrial projects in the 70s. On hindsight, was it a correct strategy but wrongly implemented? Or was it the wrong timing? On the other hand, going to the concept of JOF, I agree that we should take advantage of the global value chains, but there are clear signs that we're even missing out on that one. Classic example, Apple with the US, uh, when Trump started pushing against China and the manufacturers based in China have started to diversify to India, for example, Apple and Vietnam and Indonesia, these are getting the investments, the diversifying out of China, but we're not getting uh, any or very little of it. The second uh, troubling aspect of that on the global value chain is that our number one export is electronics and semiconductors. But it's not real, a real industrial sector because 99%, 90 plus percent of that export is also imported components. So what we are really exporting is labor, the labor component. There's no backward linkage that we really uh, uh, develop and stimulate the rest of the economy, even on the supply side. We're just basically uh, in providing the labor. I've been seeing that trend, even when you look at the customs uh, value of imports on the BSP reporting side. No, instead of just pure merchandise exports and pure merchandise imports. So, going back to question of Joff, ano talaga ang deus ex machina natin na? How do you really get out of, this, of that trap, of that vicious cycle? Where do you really start? Do you target a specific sector, a specific segment? Uh, and then build from there. Because number one, targeting is very important. Even sequencing which goes first is also very important. Thank you. Uh, I was given the mic, so let me respond quickly. Uh, actually, Diwa outlined the global value change strategy, uh, which has been recommended, highly recommended by Asian economists for us to move forward. Uh, we just have to implement that. And a practical way to implement that is to look at uh, the product space. Uh, I forget who in PIDS did the product space. Was it Connie? And uh, I can't remember. And, but anyway, you look at the product space and you can identify products uh, where we can invest little and then move quickly up the value chain. Uh, and we can implement that strategy, and I think that will go a long way in jump-starting our industrial policy and our manufacturing. Okay, and that's part of the GBC strategy. So that's the easy answer uh, to your question. Yeah. Uh, but secondly, uh, we really have to take care of our infrastructure. Okay, and that can be done. Uh, we were able, to, I benefit a great deal from the, the Skyway, right? Uh, if, if you haven't, I, I, and that even if it took some time, uh, six years longer than, ex, you know, it was completed and it benefits. So if we move small steps, right, uh, you implement a law that only certain sizes of ships can dock in Manila. The rest go to Batangas. Right. Ba Bangkok did that. Uh, Thailand did that. Okay. So small steps will bring. And then we wait for that leader. <laughs> Indefinitely, yes. Yes, DG. Well, we are all members of uh, that foundation that believes in incrementalism, Alex. Okay. So small steps, but uh, they will amount to uh, a big one later on. Now about the global value chain, I think there are three steps. One is identify, as what uh, Job was saying, identify your product space. Yes, uh, you were saying that uh, we seem to have missed out on the GBC. But that's, that's the problem when you are 
when you are starting late. But it does not mean that we are hopeless. Because the first, uh, the first step is really to identify where you can, you can position yourself and uh, reap the advantage of your, com your, your, your comparative advantage. And then second is improve your initial product space. What Job was saying, if you, have, uh, if you decided to go on, let's say, product A, what is the next step to product A? Probably is product A1, and then product A1.1, etc. until you hit the higher value, uh, value chain. And then finally, you have to marry that with the dictates of your environment and sustainability. In other words, um, not just for one or two years uh, uh, competition, but something that can, that can be sustained, sustained over the long run. Now, what is uh, good about uh, um, riding on the wave of a global uh, value chain is that it allows you to simply concentrate on a subsector of an industry. And that does not require you to put up all the big, heavy, hard infrastructure that normally accompany uh, you know, the heavy industries. But you just focus on just a small segment or a small uh, subset of the, of the entire industry. That's one. Second, um, I think, as, as Job was saying, I think it's important that while we are doing that, we also continue what we have been doing in terms of our industrial policy, never forgetting the importance of infrastructure, also human capital. We were saying earlier that uh, during the pandemic, there was serious uh, scarring of our students and even our, of our workers. So I think we should also address the problem with human, human capital, education, training, upskilling. Uh, well, of course, uh, governance is very, very important. We may have all of, those, uh, all of those strategies if the governance will be weak and short of what is required, uh, we will also have some problems. So it's a question of doing everything, even in small steps. And I think we will, one day, after probably uh, a thousand years, we'll get there. <laughs> DG Diwa, just one quick follow-up. Before we get to product A1, what is product A? What do you think should be, the, when you look at the product space, what is it for the Philippines? Well, for example, Alex was referring to semicons, okay, mm -hmm. or chips. Later on, you can graduate to something that is more processed, mm -hmm. not just okay. the semi-processed. And later on, you, you depend less on import so that your value added will be much bigger. Sh should we do what Indonesia is doing? The nickel or uh, export ban. Indonesia saying the nickel is just the prototype. They're gonna do this to other raw materials that they have. Force all of the buyers, those who need the materials, to set up shop in Indonesia. That's a correct strategy. Ah, you think? Can we command that? Do can we demand that? Well, if they want our nickel, because we also <laughs> produce our nickel. We are the second biggest. Yeah, exactly. We also so. produce our own nickel here. All right, all right. Uh, there, sir, did you want to add? Yeah, to um, respond partly to Alex's uh, comments. First, uh, I did mention some new industrial policy, and I made reference to the articles by Danny Roderick, Anne Harrison, and... Uh, 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 Andres uh, Claire, Rodri Rodriguez Claire, and they all talk about, uh, e they don't want to call it choosing winners, but uh, two things should happen uh, under an industrial policy that's uh, shepherded by government. And one is that uh, a self-discovery of the economy's true cost structure what can you produce better than the others at a lower price? Because that's always important. And then there is the coordination, uh, reducing the coordination failure. So I guess along the same global value chain, how do you make sure that you get into 
the IES return from your uh, sector development, subsector development, things like those. The industrial policy, he mentioned the 11 industrial projects during martial law. Uh, let me just remind everyone about how uh, Harry Johnson described industrialization. He said it's not just the replacement of agricultural enterprises by heavy smokestack industries. You're bound to fail if you do that. You'll be like the import substitution where many inefficient big industries failed along the way. But he said, make sure you ensure rising productivity in all three sectors, agriculture, industry, and services. You don't have to go by stage of development, but you have to do that. And then your, in the, your agriculture will be, of course, become more productive and therefore some agricultural workers will be released, but they will have to be absorbed somewhere and that's the ag agricultural sector of industry and services. So all of those things must uh, develop and that's still linked to the global value uh, uh, chain that uh, Diwa is uh, referring to because it's a strategy you're going to do a big push, so you do a, a sector, subsector kind of development. So that's, uh, I think, a clarification. These days, uh, when you read some of these uh, articles from The Economist, uh, Wall Street Journal, as well as from New York Times, they talk a lot about Indonesia and Vietnam being practitioners of the new industrial policy, but they don't say the Philippines is a <laughs> sound practitioner of good industrial policy. I don't know why. Why is that? Uh, we can catch up, I think, with Indonesia and uh, Vietnam if we can do a good practice of industrial policy. I think we can still do it. And then, um, of course, as we privatized some of our enterprises, which was for good reason, because they were very inefficient, they could not even comply with their loan covenants, the water as well as the uh, electricity sector here. So those utilities in Metro Manila had to be subjected to some structural reforms. However, as we do that, as we privatize them, make sure the regulation of this utility sector is very good. Otherwise, well, I read because Everybody in this hall, I think, knows uh, regulatory capture. That is what will happen if you don't uh, do good regulation. Dr. Canlas, just very curious, do you think we can service our way out of the middle income trap? Well, no. I, uh, yes, because it's our strongest. I will, not be, I will not be saying like what is being said now and in previous plans that we can go immediately to a high middle income. When I say high middle income, I, I'm thinking of uh, uh, the Thailand and Malaysia because those are considered high middle income already. And at the growth rate, uh, usually it takes 10 years for your GDP per mm -hmm. capita to double. Divide uh, 70 into your growth rate and that's 10 years. So what we have now will double something like six, 7,000, but Thailand and Malaysia are not standing still. So yeah. you will not be able to, they're still, they're already going into all of this. Indonesia, for example, you mentioned nickel. Indonesia has the largest deposits. Yeah. Uh, they're standing in the whole world of that. And they're really targeting, for being the manufacturing hub for electric vehicles, yeah. seemingly the wave of the future because nickel is very important for the battery. They think they can double their GDP per capita I in 10 years. Think so, because uh, it's 10, everybody's calling them in 10 practitioners years. of good industrial policy. If so, they do that, I think. Uh, they so you gentlemen think, you know, our ITBPM, you know, our OFW remittances, even Mr. Alex earlier saying our semi-cons, where it's really labor we're putting in, they're not gonna be enough to drive us. Uh, okay, the key is increasing returns to scale and manufacturing industry has that. Basically it's simple, nickel is, uh, the value of a nickel, uh, nickel raw is uh, low, but then when you combine it uh, and make it a mobile phone, then the value increases. So increasing returns to scale. 
services, you can only handle one computer at a time, right? You, you get the idea. Okay, Adiji? Yeah. Well, if we grow by six, seven, or I think even eight percent, and uh, perhaps uh, we increase our GDP and uh, GDP per capita, we don't know when the World Bank will start revising the definition <laughs> of a middle income. Okay? Remember that we almost uh, made it two or three, day, three years ago. But all of a sudden, the World Bank adjusted the cutoff. And we miss it by 200 or $300 uh, per capita. And I think it was only $150 that Indonesia was able to, uh, to, to, to climb to an upper middle income. So we don't know what's going to happen. If the World Bank decides to change the definition or the cut off, we'll be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Always a moving target. Um, I want to go back to Dr. Dante um, and this arrested development because you ended your presentation by enumerating three preconditions for takeoff. Uh, it's short-term stabilization measures, raising health status, and energy. You talked about yeah, energy. I mentioned those in my presentation, right? The, uh, I even call them prerequisites. The problems left behind by the COVID-19 pandemic, I think we make sure that we have to address the, even the what talked about the scarring effects on the youth, work, young workers. So that thing, that thing will have to be mm -hmm. done, the reskilling, the upskilling, so that we'll have, we will not have the unemployed young workers becoming unemployed adult workers once they become the, uh, mm -hmm. the more senior workers in our labor market. So. We want all of those things to happen. I call them preconditions. Solving the health issue, the stabilization of the, we have a public, mm -hmm. a deficit financing and a public debt management problem. So we have to address that. And this is where I think in some ways, the question about the role of politicians, uh, Jess of course talk about how some politicians are not really, are really good. So, we have to make sure that there is an accord on the medium-term fiscal framework. Mm -hmm. Can we reduce the deficit to GDP ratio to 3% by uh, 2020? 2020, I think they want to do that. And uh, we know it's been done before during the, I don't want to be political about it, but during the Pinoy administration, they were able to reduce it to, I believe, 2.8%, mm -hmm. that ratio. So that is pretty safe. All right. But, but Dr. Dante, you, when you enumerated the three preconditions, I assume you were referring to Walt Rostow's uh, stages of economic development, the second stage? Well, I think we have to solve them because you need uh, All right. to break through the, I call so we're it not first, because Diwa mentioned the middle income threshold yeah. that uh, was adjusted. I, I, in fact, I called it the $4,000 barrier first. I think that's how World Bank defines the middle income now. Remember, there was this book, Breakout Nations, by Ruth Suchir Sharma. Uh, he also made some predictions. Uh, as expected, Indonesia, Malaysia are called breakout nations. I don't think we're being mentioned as a breakout <laughs> nation. Yet. Not yet. So out of the five stages, we're in stage two. We're not even in the takeoff stage where growth usually sputters. You know, the health thing, that's very important. We have a legal framework, the Universal Health Care Act, yeah. which was enacted in 29. But remember, that's an enabling act. It's not an appropriations act. So each year we have to go to Congress to make mm -hmm. sure that you're... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Your activities there in UHC are uh, funded, and that's why it's very important to get a budget accord, a mm -hmm. commitment to certain numbers. Which leads me to my final question, sir. We're now in stage two, preconditions for takeoff. We're not even in takeoff stage. We're one year into the Marcos administration. More or less, you get a sense of the kind of policies in place, the direction. With what you're seeing today, 
Do you th when do you see us getting to the takeoff stage? Year, By 2028? I'll listen to both uh, State of the Nation, the first right. one last year and this one. I like, for example, what was announced and what were uh, issued after that. The, uh, what do they call it? A socioeconomic agenda where that defined the priorities of that budget, 2023. Mm -hmm. The medium-term fiscal framework that uh, was announced by the Department of Finance, and subsequently the uh, NEDA announced its Philippine Development Plan, talking about job creation and accelerated poverty reduction through a deep economic and social transformation. We know what that means, industrialization, right? So those three documents are, to me, are very good. Uh, it's just that this year, I think we are experiencing too much noise arising from, including Marlika, now the rise of cap. I think they can, they are easy problems, if you ask me. Mm. But I think everybody was saying, if Job is president, or BTY is president, <laughs> what would they do about it? Yes, sir. Uh, BBM is definitely not that leader I was referring to. Uh, all right. Um, I, I'm not a political journalist. I have no comments, sir. But um, okay, I think so. So you don't think we're going to get to take off within the next five years? Not yet. It, we can. The prescription. Okay. And Dr. Jess mentioned. All right. They did say, the Trade Department did say that they think we can be the ASEAN country with the second highest FDI by 2028. Realistic? Over ambitious? Uh, the flows. The flows. <laughs> okay, no comment from everybody. Okay, I think we're ready to wrap up. We've gone over time, so I'm going to ask my final question to all the gentlemen. Uh, I know we... Um, answerable by one word. No need to explain your answer, just one word. So this series is being done for PCED 50. Ten years from now, we're back to this hall. What do you think are we going to be talking about? For PCED 60 naman. Just one word. What do you think are we going to be talking about? Maybe we start with Dr. Jess. Sir? Well, if we get ourselves together, we'll be talking about three things that we should have accomplished. If we grow from 10 to 12 percent, which I think is possible in the next 20 years or so, and that is, we'll be talking about the new level of growth that we should be aiming at, the okay. quality of growth, second, the equity, equity. that has been no Filipino left behind, and third, we will be in the upper third of countries and the levels of competitiveness. Those All are the right. three things that we should be talking about. Three things. After growing by 10 to 12% per year, which I think is possible. 10 to 12%, wow. All right. Dr. Joff? I'm trying to count six years. When's the next election? No. No, but uh, I think we'll be talking what about leadership. Right, leadership. Dr. Uh, DG Diwa. Middle income trap. Pavin! <laughs> Did they move the goalpost, sir? Or hindi pa rin natin na hit yung number? If we sustain this kind of governance mm -hmm. and economic management, we'll be, doing, we'll be discussing the same issue 10 years from now. Okay. In other words, if we adhere to the policy of muddling through, then we'll be back to zero 10 right. years from now. All right, um, Dr. Dante, your final, the final word from the man of the hour, 10 years from now, what are we talking 10 about? 10 years from now, I think we have to leap, we will leapfrog to a knowledge economy, and I think PCE, the, uh, as you said, what will be talking about, if uh, the powers that be uh, will allow it, I think we will continue to be part of creating that knowledge no. economy in economics, but I hope 
all the other institutions, like we're entering a climate change mitigation problem. So I hope the science and technology will also do their share. All right, knowledge economy on that note. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause, please, for our Dr. Dante Canlas and our discussants, Dr. Joseph Yap, Dr. Uh, DJ Diwa Ginigundo, and of course, Dr. Jesse Stenslow. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. But um, we're not done yet. We have a few more items on the agenda. Uh, before we end, we'd like to ask, oh, the discussant, sir, please. Um, no, no, no. Um, we'd like to present first. A picture daw muna. Picture muna daw. Um, Dr. Joff, please um, join us back on stage. DG Diwa and uh, Dr. Dante, please join us. Uh, I hope Dr. Jess is still is he still online for a quick picture please a uh, gentleman okay we sit uh, okay. sitting down or okay. Thank you very much once again. Before we end, uh, Dr. Canlas, we would like to present you uh, a token of our appreciation. May we now request to join us on stage, Dr. Carl Robert Handok, Chairman of the UP School of Economics, and Dr. Laarni Esquesa, College Secretary. All right. Dito na lang, sir, sa harap, so the picture can capture, the photographers can capture. So what are we giving as a token of appreciation, Dr. Canlas, on behalf of the UP School of Economics and the Philippine Center for Economic Development, we present to you Nostalgic Decision. There you have it. It's the painting behind. This artwork by James Gabito is an essential recreation of the past, derived from his sentiments of life and culture in a time-bound custom and setting. Yet the artist keeps the spirit of old Manila intact through his own adroit visualizations, culminating perceptions and interpretations anew. Thank you once again, Dr. Canlas. Now some final announcements are on your screen. There you have it, the schedule for the rest of the 50 years of economic policy making lecture series. May we also invite you to please join us in the next PCED at 50 lecture. This time will be by NEDA Secretary Arsenio Balisacan. This is happening on October 27. We're also conducting a feedback survey, so kindly fill out the survey form and help us with your responses by scanning this QR code right here flashed on the screen or the printed QRs on your table. And with that, we thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Snacks and refreshments available at the back. Thank you once again. <laughs>